Welcome to the 134th episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So historically paranormal. My name is Jason Knight, host of the show, and with me, as always, is... Oscar Spector. Producer extraordinaire and podcast co-host. Listeners, if you want to skip our cantankerous intros, Hmm. go to the show notes. There'll be a timestamp there for you to get you right to the topic. That is a fun $5 word that doesn't get used enough. Yes, and I don't even think it fits because cantankerous is kind of like... Uh, like bitter, right? Like um, Bitter. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know what? Like an old man and shit. Yes. Yeah. Get off my lawn shit. Yeah. But you know what? I was a little bitter about something we're going to talk about. You, you had quite <laughs> the cantankerousness on you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Bef- before we get into mm-hmm. the uh, April Fool's prank you pulled on me, uh, <laughs> what's been going on with you, my friend? How are things? Honestly, I spent my entire time since the last time we recorded uh, thinking about this April Fool's prank. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> it literally happened you know, for five minutes. Um, let's see. What, ha- what have I been up to? Uh, let's see. Oh, we're writing the part two for this show that we're recording or the intro for this show that we're recording. This is very time lapse stuff we're doing. <laughs> Because yes, <laughs> uh, magic of editing implies that we are recording this opening obviously very soon around right after April Fool's uh, Day, and uh, but the content was made over two weeks ago, was recorded over two weeks ago, and I'm still writing part two as of this recording, so I don't know where I am. Um, time, it's funny. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, I've been doing this thing where, um, you know, I'm having, I'm gonna host uh, a little party, like a little get together, not a party. That sounds bigger. A little get together at my house for uh, April twenty fifth. I want to say the last Sunday of the month, uh, where um, it's, they're going to do the Oscar Academy Awards ceremony, and I usually I'm there to watch it. I took the day off from work, and um, I invite a few people over, and I've been watching a lot of the nominees, like online and stuff like that. So, what are what are your some some of your favorites so far? Uh, well, I'm saving some of the ones that I know are like not just big ones, but big ones I've been looking forward to. So I've been saving some like Nomadland. I haven't seen that yet. I want to see it without interruption on a big screen or on my big on the big screen on my TV. Um, but uh, I really, really like White Tiger. White, check out White Tiger, everyone. I highly recommend that one by Ramin Barani. It's an Indian movie or movie in, uh, in India. Sorry, not in the end. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? It's an Indian movie, uh, but it's it's mainly in English. They put, they have it's it's uh, they have other their languages too, but it's like it's mainly English. Very good movie. Um, it's like it's a really cool like quest type of story or like a growing up story. And um, let's see, what's another one I really liked? Um, I saw a lot of the short ones which I like. I was watching. Um, oh, you know who I what I saw is I saw my octopus teacher, and I recommend you to watch that one. I've seen it so many times on uh, Amazon Prime, I think. It's Netflix. Netflix. It, Netflix. Okay. And I'm like, uh, do I press the button? Do I watch it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I recommend it. It's my favorite. It's a documentary. I love documentaries. And it's, I mean, 80% of the entire movie is underwater. So right there, you should be a fan of. You know I'm in. And it's following the life of an octopus, kind of. Yeah, for the most part. And it's it, But it's just a story. There's an actual thing going on. And it's a, a good rapport between the swimmer. And his octopus, and it's amazing. That it is, is my so favorite cute. of the documentaries. So really, mm-hmm. all right, I will check it out. Although that should be said, that I haven't seen two of them. I'm still missing two others to watch. Uh, but yeah, really amazing. I highly recommend that one. Wow. Um, what's another? I saw Ma Rainey's uh, Black Bottom, which is also on Netflix. It's the one where um, Chadwick Boseman, who recently passed, of course, uh, got nominated for Best Actor. Him and uh, who is the actress and plays Ma Rainey? Viola Davis? Is it Viola Davis? Whoever it is. They're both nominated. And I saw this movie. It takes place in like in the 40s or something during the maybe maybe earlier than that, maybe 20s, um, during the Blues Age, right? And it's about them doing this recording. 
and it's an amazing movie. Really, a lot. I mean, it, it, it's written like a play. A lot of great dialogue, a lot of solo stuff, a lot of like monologue. Sorry, uh, a lot of monologuing, a lot of um, uh, great performances. It's, it's a movie for actors, basically. It's a really good acting performance. But okay, those I recommend. Those I recommend. I'm not gonna say them all here, but um, yeah, those are the top three that I kind of remember the most. Um, yeah, and for funsies, I liked uh, Love and Monsters. Check that out. Love and oh Monsters. yes, it, I had fun with that movie. Okay, I'll check that one out too. It's nominated it's, for uh, uh, special effects, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's another one I passed up a few times, but I, I also passed it, it up a lot of times, and I was like, ah, fuck it, I'll just play it. This was last night. I'll just play it, and I was, I was into it completely. Saw the whole thing. Didn't want to feel like stopping it. That was just a fun movie to watch. Um, and I like the story. So, yeah. Excellent. Mm-hmm. You know what we watched? It has nothing to do with the uh, Oscars, but mm-hmm. we did watch Godzilla vs King Kong. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. How is it? It was fantastic. Really? I, I had a smile on my face the whole time. Well, what's it? What do you compare? Uh, I mean, compare it to the uh, the recent King Kong and Godzilla movies. How does it pair up to those? How does it compare? Uh, see, I liked uh, I know this is going to be such a generic answer, but I liked them all. I mean, did I, all? I did. Yes. Um, re- reliving my childhood, you know, with those two characters, it was just, and, and it was just great. They went all out with fight scenes and the special effects you know if right. you s- just sit there for entertainment suspend disbelief and just enjoy it, it it's wonderful i'm definitely gonna try that so i'm never great. gonna go in there with like a critical eye but um yeah I, I i want to enjoy these movies i really like kong skull island yeah with to- jack black yeah yeah i had mm, is that jack black no it wasn't i think so you think of peter jackson's king kong that had jack black oh right? Yeah, you think of the wrong movie. Oh, there you go. So right, Kong Skull Island has... I mean, I'm not saying Jack Black isn't, because there's a lot of big actors in that movie, but I don't think he's the main guy. Hmm, okay. Kong Skull Island has uh, John C. Riley, and uh, I don't remember anymore. I saw it in theaters. But I remember I had fun with that movie. That movie didn't take itself too seriously, and I think it was kind of it was fun. It was fun watching the island and all the monsters in it. I just had fun with that movie. But I had more fun with it compared to the other Godzilla movies, which got very political and got overly serious. And don't get me wrong, I like it when movies try something, but like it didn't work for me, you know. So yeah. I'm I'm hoping that this movie is more like Skull Island than the Godzilla remakes. I'm, I guess I'm totally confusing a couple movies then, because maybe maybe. I, maybe I didn't see Skull Island. Now that I'm thinking about it, I mean, you saw this on? Did you see this on HBO? Because it's on there, right? Yeah, oh, oh, the new one. Yes, the yes. new one, right? So. Uh, they have right now all of the all of those movies, including uh, Skull Island, I think. So you can watch it just to see if you've seen it. Yeah, that's what I'll it's have to there. do. Then, then I can compare and contrast. Yeah, you know. right. You, it's on there. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm obviously I'm, I'm hoping it's fun. I just want to have fun times with it. I definitely don't want like, you know, I don't know, super serious shit. But um, I hope it's fun. I want to enjoy it just like you did. I want to enjoy it like you. Yeah, yeah. And we watched it with my son. You know, he he was totally into it seeing these massive yeah. creatures just totally battle it out and there's some surprises which i'm not going to ruin of course uh which which really just just drove it home this is so cool awesome i would so it out. yeah well there you have it some some movies to check out for the oscars check out uh godzilla vs king kong on hbo plus other than that uh whew, magic of editing i'll be heading out to new orleans very quickly here mm. uh, so i wanted to make sure we get this recorded uh, mm-hmm. so we don't miss anything while i'm on the road uh, but other than that you know finished up the end of our fiscal year at work uh, very well i was number one in the country so i'm very very happy with that nice. and uh now it's into the the rat race of the the new fiscal very That's nice congrats it. good job man good job. thank you thank you i busted my ass for that man you but, definitely did i mean i could you mean <laughs> your hairline your the back <laughs> your eyes your <laughs> All that shows that you busted your ass, yeah. Yeah, and, and it it paid off. Uh, your rising psychosis. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, now, let's we, get into something fun. Um, yes. So, um, as you're aware, as I said already, and kind of Jay alluded to a little bit here, um, we're recording this on April the 2nd. Funny thing, about 24 hours ago, it was April the 1st, April Fool's Day. I decided to pull a little prank on Jay. <sighs> Yes, Our own did. Jason Knight. I pulled a prank on him, and f- through the course of 24 hours, he had thought that something was real when it wasn't. Um, um, I'll just tell the story. And if you want to play it, or, you, or we can decide then if we want to play a clip of it. Um, 
I was working yesterday. I put first. And at my work, I have this coworker. Her name is Gabby, Gabriella. And she oh, and that's yo, to- that's yo Gabba Gabba. Yeah, yeah, yo, yo Gabba right. Gabba. Right, right. Oh, we she talked about her before. Damn we it. We did. We did talk about it. That's right. You should have thought you should have really pieced this together. I did. did not even think of that. So I had her call our stupid fake ass shitty phone number, the eight seven two one. I don't know the whole the rest of it. Um I had her like this is like a double hit for me, like from me. Like it, it not only could I play a prank on Jay, but I get to make fun of that fucking phone number at the same time. So like I had her call him, call the the, the show, I mean. She's bashing us. And uh, she would quickly tell me, like, oh, man, she was unsure at first. She was, like, kind of nervous about it. And she's like, no, no, no. And I, I egged her on. Like, no, no, you should totally do it. Whatever. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And so she went to the bathroom at my store to have privacy. And then she made the phone call. And she told me what she said. And I was like, oh, my God. I hope. I was like, Jay's going Jay's gonna to have a fucking field day with this one. And, of course, literally. <laughs> Two hours later, he texts me and shit. He's like, dude, we got a fucking hate boy, hate mail and shit. Our first hate mail. He was saying all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it worked. And then I let you stew on it for 24 hours until we yes, got on the mics today. Yes, you did. Mm-hmm. Yes, you did. Yeah. So tell us what, what the experience of going through 24 hours. Well, first, why don't we play? Let's play that lovely mm-hmm. voicemail. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we'll <laughs> tell you my reaction. Let's do it. Hello, my name is Gabriella, and I live in the Chicago area. And I just wanted to let you know that your podcast sucks. The worst podcast I've ever listened to. And I just had to let you know. Thank you so much. Come out with better content. <laughs> so what you think? First of all. Uh-huh. I had to listen because, you know, I'm psychotic. I'm I'm OCD. Mm-hmm. I had to listen to that voicemail like 30 times. You didn't have to. And I just get, I was getting angrier and angrier mm-hmm. every yeah. time I hit replay. Uh-huh. Um, I, I literally lost sleep last night because I'm so, <laughs> I'm, I dreamt about who this person could oh be my God. That's like what they look like, how they live. I was thinking of all these right. zingers to come back with. Right. Uh, it, it, I couldn't sleep because I'm, I'm so <laughs> anal about this show and I, yeah. you know, I'm so mm-hmm. prideful about this show. Uh, uh, and I love it so much to think that there was someone out there that hated us that much. Right. Actually took the time. Right. Yeah, they yeah. could call. Make and then call. that right at the end, get better content. Yeah. Oh dude. Sent me over the moon, man. I just yeah. Can't. We, we workshop that. She was like, should I add this in it? Yeah. Yes. I'm like, yes, do that. And definitely add that. And then I was getting mad. I'm like, why isn't Oscar writing me back? Why doesn't he respond to this? What's the matter? <laughs> I mean, if this was real, I still probably wouldn't respond. I'd be like, okay, okay fuck him. Uh, and I was thinking like, you know, oh, we should play it. We should play it on the show. And then right. after, like, right after we could play uh, Ice Cubes, a bitch is a bitch from back in the day. Right. And I was thinking like all these things, how do I come back with? And then you told me, hey, dude, uh, what day was yesterday? I'm like, uh, <laughs> it was April 1st. Why? It's- I'm like another what's name the, for it. What's, what's the other name for April first? I go April Fool, and you ha. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I really walked. Yeah, I really walked that one out. And I was thinking, folks, to just let it slide up until we recorded this opening, and then halfway through his his bitch, you know, him putting an ice cube on, that I would then interrupt him and say, "Hey, April Fools," you know, like, but like. <laughs> I didn't because oh I didn't know how much the stewing how much d- damage I've done with the stewing is basically what I didn't know so I played it safer and uh, instead I told them right before we started actually recording this well not before recording I mean it'll be in the outtakes you know whatever but like um because <laughs> this reaction is funny it's in the outtakes everyone listens to the outtakes um but I w- I wanted to wait until b- before we actually did the ro- the rolling of this whole thing the opening so. Um, but I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did, because I did. <laughs> I'm glad you did. <laughs> um, uh, I had, uh, you know, my food turned to acid. It was great. It was fine. Yeah. Was- times. <laughs> Happy fun times for Jay. Beat up a homeless person for no reason. 
<laughs> uh, didn't you say Lexi was like nervous about it or something? Yeah, she was more nervous, but she, I mean, I, man, I've also got like 10 years more on her and on you than on her. So yeah. like, you know, like, no, I think it'll be fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I told her like, he's not fine now, but he will be tonight. <laughs> Dude, well played. That Thank was you. that was very good. You you had me hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, I I also did. I also think I overplayed my hand because I told you like three shows ago that I'm gonna do this. No, you did, and that that's another. So Gabby, right? Yo, Gabby, yeah. Gabby. We yeah. talked about her on the show, and you're yeah. right. A couple episodes ago, mm-hmm. you said I'm gonna get you with that phone number. Yeah, and I completely forgot about it. I did not you put did. two and two together. Yeah, I'm. That's blame your job for that one. The fiscal ear thing really fried you. <sighs> No, you. I could have told you I was going to Mars today and you would have forgotten. Uh, <laughs> is, Oscar should be recording right now. Where is he? <laughs> There's a time delay. There's a time delay on the Zoom by five minutes. Because I'm so <laughs> far away. Um, yeah. Well, there you go, listeners. This is what I have to deal with. This is what I have to deal with. No, it was great. I love you, man. That was awesome. Yeah. Although if I, if I was Dave and Dave did that to you, he would never tell you. <laughs> yeah, and I would probably fucking strangle him. Right, right. With you, it's funny. With him, I'm sure there's some underlying hatred oh, somewhere. Oh, maybe. Oh, I never thought of that, but maybe you're right on that one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. This is just me being funny and fun. I, I'm, I'm always doing this to customers, to everyone, all the time. I'm constantly pranking and telling people things are not true at all. <laughs> it, it, that reminds me what we talked about on our uh, Patreon episode for March. How you, you like to put pentagrams? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Into the customer's drink. I did it today. Today. <laughs> Dude, it's Good Friday. You can't do that on Good Friday. It's not good no more. <laughs> What's so good about it? It ain't good no more. They drank it. They drank it's my no good no more. They drank my sins. <laughs> you know, Jesus or whatever. Christ. Whatever they believe. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Love it. Uh, should we get, should we get into contact information? I don't, I don't know. know if sure I you want to open up. You don't know if you want to open up this fucking Pandora's box for our customers listeners to. I know. I might just shut of. down the phone right. number. You <laughs> might. That's it. Then my mission, my ultimate mission in my life, has been accomplished. <laughs> this is a win-win for me, no matter how you look at it. Uh, get this fucking uh, phone number off the air. Cancel phone number. <laughs> Alexa, cancel phone number. <laughs> well, she does it for you. She's just thinking. Uh, the easiest way to to contact the Supernatural Current Studies podcast is by visiting our website, chicagoghostpodcast.com. From chicagoghostpodcast.com, you get to all of our social platforms, including Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, Patreon. Mm-hmm. And listeners, in case you didn't know, for just $5 a month, you could get access to a library of Patreon-only podcast episodes. These are episodes that will never appear here on our public feed. It's just for our patrons. It's our way of saying thank you and thank you for the support. So what do you say? Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast, or just click the Patreon link in this episode show notes, and it'll take you right to us. Uh, you could contact the show via email, contact at chicagoghostpodcast.com. Mm-hmm. Or if you're brave enough, you could call our phone number. Stupid enough, you mean? <laughs> That's Chicago area code 872-529-0767. I was going to say it right now. If you make that phone call, your penis is falling off. That's, him. That's all I'm saying. You will become a eunuch. Yeah. Uh, 872-529-0767. Leave us a message, send us a text. We'll read them and play them on the show. Uh, Oscar, my my guts hurt from laughing so much. All oh, the more reason it was worth it. Well, I'm really excited to get into this episode. I have no idea what this episode is about. You've held it close to your chest for well over a month. Um, you haven't even sent me pictures to go along with it yet. You're, you're waiting until you tell me the <laughs> and story. And there's like 50 pictures. Oh, jeez. <laughs> So I'm 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 really excited to see uh, what this episode is about. Uh, but the title doesn't give me anything. Probably doesn't give the listeners anything. I hope this not. Is, this is all you, brother. I work I hard. I'm being vague here. Yeah, all I know is it's 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 a it's a tome. Yes, this it is, is a, a long. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. It's a long one, and the next one will be even longer, probably. That, hey, that's all right. That's what they tune in for. Right. All right, Oscar. Let's uh, let's start it. Let's take a break. Mm-hmm. Look, Tangerine 
Það veit ég ekki sko Um við bræður nú þann þroska Hvað nefni myndu mök á oss leita Hví hefur oss eigi orðu ágengt í þeim Þetta er Ansos Esíó en emesí Esti katíó san mantóos Rigetó e tú a getí Irmoshini <laughs> Listeners, welcome back to the show. Well, the lights are turned down low, the ceremonial candle is lit, and the drinks are flowing. Let's start this show. So, Oscar, <laughs> even by the title of this episode, I don't right. know what it is. I don't know what it is. And the listeners don't know what it is by the title. Very clever, right. man. Very clever. I stole the title idea from Community, the show Community. They often title their things based on what uh, a class will be titled, like yeah, yeah, introduction yeah. to math or something. They will put introduction to whatever the show, some tomfoolery, you know, as a funny joke. So I named it zip code unavailable because I think one of the titles is like that, like um, story unavailable was one of the titles for their episodes. Uh, and little, I stole the idea from them. Yeah. A little behind the scene there. A little bit. Yeah. A little, little, little background on this <laughs> so, idea. Mm-hmm. So this, uh, this is going to be a two-parter. Definitely. And it's it's a, a it's your tome. It's your, your it's a tome for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a tome. It this is uh gonna be long. I'm really interested in what this could possibly be. You've kept it very close to your chest. Yes. You have a bunch of pictures that are gonna go along with this. Listen shit ton. Make sure and check the show notes. There's gonna be links to photos that go along with Oscar's story. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the pictures you wouldn't send to me prior. <laughs> to this recording because you said like <laughs> give it away. So right. again, I have no idea what we're in for, but right. I am excited. I hope you guys are too. Oscar, if you're ready, mm-hmm. um, let, let's hear what you got. And keep in mind that a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be mentioning will reference a lot of future shows. Uh, some of them already that we've started. I'm being vague there too, by the way. Um, some other stuff we mentioned in the past regarding... Um, I don't know, other types of conspiracies that relate to this in a strange way. Um, but it is weird. It is weird. Un- and unlike this show, what I'm going to talk about, but it does relate heavily, especially once you get to part two, you're going to be like, oh, fuck, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So wow. here we go. So I have an all opening here. <clears throat> He's getting ready. Yeah, I know, right? Positioning himself. Right. Now I got to have my narrator voice on. All right. So. Populated areas of mankind, such as cities and towns, are defined by more than how many people they have and how many square miles they possess. They are partly defined by their age, their ability to stay alive and active through the decades, if not centuries. A town, for example, can be easily measured by meeting only a few of its citizen, citizens, while larger metropolitan areas are measured by how it looks and by what other people say. Towns and cities are seen not as a person that houses people, but a character in the grand stories that people see day by day by living in it. There's a melancholy when disaster hits them, joy when a new building gets erected, remorse when violence breaks out. And yes, I'm talking about Chicago. All of that applies to Chicago. (laughs) The point is, love it or hate it, everyone has a feeling about where they live, area, and zip codes alike. It is difficult to imagine that an infamous city like Sydney or Paris could be forgotten by time. They feel like they'll always be around, but if we're using time as an indicator, and I am, that means they will be gone one day. Sydney and Paris, for example. 
Don't you think that the people of Babylon or Troy or Carthage believed that their beloved city was going to last? Whether it's the changing of kingdoms or battles or a cloud of ash like in Pompeii, cities have a lifespan, an undeterminable lifespan. It means that a city like Los Angeles may baffle people of the future when they read those giant Hollywood sign letters, right? One day, people are going to be like, why did they write this? What is this about? Today, we're going to explore some of the places either time or humanity has elected to forget. You might ask, what does this have to do with supernatural or conspiracies? Since a big component of, of the supernatural is about what we don't know, it really isn't much of a leap to discover or rediscover some of the lost characters that are honestly also steeped into what's weird about our world and customs of mankind. Just think of all the beliefs created by their locations and how those customs led to strange human behavior, whether in the form of war or peace. I also realize that this is a good premise to talk about the lost city of Atlantis, for example, or El Dorado, right? But I will not for this episode. I don't want to squash that belief right now. I will not be talking about those places. They will be mentioned or hinted at when talking about other locations that are eerily similar I have primarily chosen places with facts that have been photographed and their, photo and their whereabouts accepted by the people who looked them up and archaeologists and scientists. That being said, I will tell you about some obvious and not so obvious conspiracies that led to hidden or forgotten cities later on. For now, for now though, know that this show is divided into five sections or types of lost cities I wanted to research. Okay, let's begin so, here. Yeah, I love it. You I love, love it? it. So that's yeah. what it is. That's what it is. Yes, Lo actual lost and forgotten. Yeah, places on our earth, cities. So I definitely knew a very little of these before I started researching. Oh, that's great! I love that. I would have really never says thought how of that. Uneducation, I am really. <laughs> <laughs> how bad my education was is really a testament of the show right here. Um, the the other thing too during your intro there made me think when you're like yeah people how they're they're proud of their city even their zip code right yeah yeah oh yeah I mean that's so true I was so you know growing up we were so proud to be part of the three one two zip code in Chicago you know yeah, that's the, the that's, city man that's you know the town one yeah yeah that yeah. that's what you're part of that's where you that that's what made you, you also three one two is uh you know how they made zip codes and stuff like that and and area codes and stuff like that is uh. Oh, area it's, code. I'm sorry. You meant area code, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Well, for example, like uh, the really big cities, they have like I think New York has one. There are zip codes. Uh, they have a major zip code with one in it that starts with one, and that means it's like the the biggest city in the, in our country. Ah. So the fact that we're three one two means we're like the third biggest. So, like, you know what I mean? And I think that's true. Is I think that's true. I think yeah. we are the third big New York, L A, and mm -hmm. Chicago. Yeah, that's what but, we're three one two. Yeah, I mean, well, six zero six three four. You know, that was yeah. the our zip code in Chicago, and yeah, we were proud of it. You're right. Yeah, I'm in six one six zero six one four, one four. I I moved. I'm I don't remember. Right, right. <laughs> I forget <laughs> where I am now. Um. Anyway, here's the first section, and it should be mentioned though. Uh, before I didn't put this in the script for some reason. Uh, I said there's five sections. Two of them are going to be in part two, so three of them are today. Just oh, gotcha, for everyone. Gotcha, right. gotcha. So I didn't put that distinction in there. All right. So the first section is the longest. And I simply call it Cities Lost to Time. Panolti, ni Diego Iwan Ashkan. Equidem nullum aliud concilium nisi mali vestri impediendi di neo. El te ton hypnos amarta. Luon melodema tatum. They reflect a good sampling of humankind and their efforts to gain glory, either honestly or mischievously. Like the dinosaurs, some of these cities were selected by Mother Nature for extinction or they're a byproduct of being on the losing side of an ancient war. This first section will also acclimate everyone to what's in store after. It should be said that I'll be butchering some names and words here, <laughs> so I apologize in advance. Please <laughs> forgive me. There's so many different languages on this thing. Whew. No hate mail. No hate mail. No, bring it on. If I said like, oh, man, he could have just easily said this. That's fine. Tell me. I would love to know. I, I could have researched the, the pronunciation. I did for some of these, but I gave up at some point or just so many of them. Um, so remember also to uh, look at the pictures as I go along. They will be titled accordingly. And I will title each, each location as I go. So don't worry. You'll know. And there'll be a hefty pause between. 
Um, so let's begin bucket listing our world travel plans. And I'm gonna start off with something called the Mon Governorate, Governorate, I'm already fucking up, which is in Jordan. Right out of the gate, I'm starting with an odd choice. The country of Jordan, much like most countries, contain borders within borders, often called regions. We call them, you know, states. One of these regions in Jordan is called the Mon Governorate. The name came from a small city called Just Mon in the same region. Much like most of the locations on this list, Mon is no stranger to rule. Mon was founded by an ancient Arab people based in Yemen called Minaeans, who named the region Mon originally. From the Byzantine era in Syria to the Umayyads in the year 951, to Ottoman Syria rule in the 19th century, Ma'an was often cast aside. It was really a way station, a stepping stone to other areas of the vast desert and other countries. It's Jordan's El Paso, basically. Think of it that way. Okay. Because El Paso is very tiny, but very useful, right? Because it's a border town. The Ma'an government is not home to one massive city steeped in ancient history, but instead has over the centuries housed several towns and cities where much of the ancient evidence exists in place for anyone to visit. I went with the Mon Governorate to begin the list in order to highlight how one region in one country has so much history and cultural attachment to mankind. Imagine how extensively extensive my list can get. Another reason I've chosen this region to begin is because one great ancient city that rests in the southwest area. It is the city of Petra, Jordan. Its size is 264 square kilometers, contains almost 20 towns and villages today, with a population of 23,087 from a census taken in 2004. Its ruins, miraculously intact, has been, visit has been a visitor's delight for years. It lies in a basin surrounded by mountains, which form the eastern flank of the Araba Araba Valley, which uh, runs from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. Petra, as a location in humanity, uh, has, been, has been around since a few travelers took a breather on that land way back in the Neolithic era. But in the name, but the name, sorry, comes from ancient Greek, meaning rock, and it was established before Roman times. So it's an old city. Hmm. This marvelous city is home to ruins, and I love these titles, by the way, such as the Obelisk Tomb, Kassar al-Bint, the Hadrian Gate, the Garden Temple, the Colored Triclinium, Tomb of the Roman Soldier, the Urn Tomb, Petra Monastery Trail, and the Petra Pool and Garden Complex. I just love those names. Yeah. The biggest thing in Petra is Al-Kashne, which stands for Treasury. It was like the Treasury Department back then and is one of the most elaborate, elaborate temples built. The structure is believed to have been the mausoleum of, of, uh, of the Tibetan king, Aretas IV, in the first century AD. al Kashne is made of sandstone. It was built out of the rock face of the mountain, giving it a sense of being hidden as part of nature. It has a really cool sense. This appearance nearly qualified Petra as an entry to another segment in this episode, but decided otherwise because it was way too popular even back then. UNESCO, U-N-E-S-C-O, which stands for United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, called a vote to call this rock face structure one of the new seven wonders of the world. Petra managed to take in over 1 million tourists in its biggest year ever in 2019. Obviously a lot less now. Nice. Al Kashne is featured in several games and films, including in the most popular Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Which I know you haven't seen, right? No, no. You're not, you're not a Jones fan. No. Um, ruins within and outside of Petra have been discovered over centuries, the latest being in 2016. So they're still finding a lot of shit there. Hmm. Very, I, I know I've heard of Petra. I, could, I, I couldn't have told you anything about it, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's sounds cool. I wonder what the gardens, what yeah. that's like in the middle of a desert. I think know? one of the three pictures might be of the gardens. Okay, good. 
Good. Yeah, they include so one again, of Petra, I, one of the... Wait, so many... I haven't again, seen them. The pictures. Right, you haven't seen them yet because I'm sending them after this recording. All right, up to the second one here. Second one is called Lepsis Magna in Libya. Lepsis Mag Magna was founded in the 7th century BC and oddly enough was abandoned in 7th century AD. Its original name was a Punic name. Its root meaning is root name meaning to build or to piece together but it was the great influence of the time ancient greece that changed it to lepsis magna it means basically just greater magna which distinguish distinct distinguishes from the lesser magna location near carthage like a smaller city in what is known now as lebanon the semitic speaking Thess thessalocratic civilization called phoenicia founded Lepsis Magna. This ancient city, despite renaming influence by Greece, was powerful enough to repel attacks from Greek colonies around 515 BC. And it must be said real quick here that um, Greece was an ancient power. They had so much influence back then. This is, this, this is, I'm talking a lot about the era when they had all the influence in the world. There were the British Isles, you know, what they were going to be later on, right? So just saying, you know, that fighting off Greece back then was a big deal. Got it. Not now. Now it's probably really easy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to the show. Carthage's defeat in the Punic Wars led to Roman rule for Lepsis Magna. The Vandal Kingdom took control of the city in 439. The Byzantine Empire, in the name of the Roman after, and the Roman Empire after, and finally, by the sixth century, Islamic conquests took hold before it was abandoned. Lepsis Magna was uncovered by the British in the 1800s, but was mistreated. The city was rediscovered by the Italians. There you go. In right, yeah, by, in 1915, and was safeguarded by them and its harbor as a gateway to Africa. Because of this, the ruins of Lepsis Magna is considered to have the best preserved Roman sites in the Mediterranean. Wow. Yeah, thank you, Italians. There are over 15 beautiful foundations like basilicas, marketplaces, and theaters. Unfortunately, not everything is in Lepsis, Mag Lepsis Magna proper. Part of the ancient temple, for example, was brought to the British Museum in 1816. In the year 2000, archaeologists found five colorful mosaics that were made during the first and second century. The mosaics had amazing clarity, depicting a warrior in combat, with a deer, for example, for young men wrestling a wild bull and a gladiator resting in a state of fatigue, for example. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, these wonderful pieces are considered to be one of the best preserved items from that time period, second only to the Babylonian mosaics they found. Wow. That is so, I mean, finding something that beautiful from that long ago, it's, yeah. that's amazing. So and preserved. I mean, that's, it's nuts. Yeah, but uh, you know, Britain almost fucked that up, by the way. So I'm just letting you know. Thanks, um, British. Thanks, British. But thanks, Italians. Anyway, next up here is an old one. Gobleki Tepe. Fuck, I hope I said that right. Gobleki, Gobekli Tepe, Turkey. It's in Turkey. Gobekli Tepe, yes. Yeah, you know this one? I've heard of this, yes. Gobekli Tepe. I never heard of it before this research, actually. This entry may be the oldest place humanity will ever be able to find. Certainly the oldest on this list. You want to know what hunter-gatherer humans were up to? Archaeologists' prime discovery is Gobekli Tepe. In Turkey, the site is located in the southeastern Anatolia region. What led archaeologists to this spot is something they call a tell, which is a formation on the land that wasn't made naturally but by man. It is how many ruins in general are discovered when flying overhead or outlined or surveyed at a distance. It's a tell, right? Much was discovered at the Gobleki Tepe site. It, was, it is very difficult to determine and carbon date the plants and animals in the region, so the best indicator became the ground and the rock formations. The site was discovered as a, at a survey being conducted by Istanbul University and the University of Chicago in 1963. Mm. Go Chicago. Go Chicago. Uh, also Istanbul, I guess. Here's, <laughs> here's what is known, either accurately or roughly, since 1963. The ruins of Gobekli Tepe, which is just a temple, really, was founded pre-10th millennium BCE. 
and abandoned by the 8th millennium BCE. It's a, long, it's a long fucking time ago. This is the Neolithic era, folks. This is before pottery and writing was invented. Again, look at the pictures. But you'll see that the temple was constructed in layers and rings. These layers have been discovered bit by bit over the decades. The temple follows a geometric pattern, and stone pillars weighing in the neighborhood of 10 tons apiece are fitted into sockets that were hewn out of the local bedrock. It's fascinating because of how little we thought of Neolithic humans and how little we knew and still don't know. It says that hunter-gatherers had belief and a willingness to construct that belief into this stonework that became everlasting. There's a lot of work still being done at the site, which is off limits to civilians. One thing is for sure, though, Gobeki Tepe is a treasure trove of ongoing knowledge. Definitely heard of this. I feel like there's an ancient alien connection to, to Gobekli Tepe. It's a very good chance that this is the, the inspiration for um, Prometheus, the movie, or it's one of them. Really? I think so. Using the site of something very old and ancient as a way to like say that aliens existed, like this knowledge to build this stuff was given to them, to humans back then by aliens. I think so. I think I, I, think I saw something like that once. Uh, I'm yeah. not sure if in that movie or another one, but I've heard of that. And it might be this site. But the name, I never, I never heard of the name before. Kobalaki Tepe. Yeah. Great. Yeah. The the uh, I'm looking at a picture of that. Um, mount, not mound. The the structure the there. The pillars. Yeah. 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 It's 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 pretty amazing. It's old as fuck too. Old as fuck. Could not be older. All right. Moving on to a different continent altogether, guys. We're going to Calakmul, Mexico. Calakmul. Calakmul. I love saying that. Um, deep in the jungles of the Petén Basin, in what is known today as Campeche, Mexico, in the Yucatán Peninsula, lies what once was one of the largest ancient Mayan cities. We know Calakmul used to be this grand bustling city because of how much was discovered. Just 22 miles from the Guatemalan border, Calakmul is roughly 8 square miles in size, and its central monument is approximately 0.77 square miles, or 2 square kilometers in size. It's a big fucking temple. It is estimated that this city had a population of 50,000 people, plus governance over places as far as 150 miles away. Mm. Calakmul is dubbed as the Snake Kingdom. It is called Snake Kingdom, or Kingdom of the Snake, because of the fact that they would administer or distribute an emblem glyph of a snake head sign to all structures, and it was read as Khan. Interesting little fact there. Kalakmul is a modern name, though. First discovered in 1931 by a man named Cyrus Lundell, he came up with the name Kalakmul as follows. Ka means two, lak means adjacent, and mul signifies any man-made pyramid or mound. So Kalakmul stands for the city of the two ancient pyramids. And they were active somewhere between 250 and 900 CE, which is the classic era, up to somewhere in the post-classic era, which is 900 to 1521 CE. You know, a lot of of numbers here. (laughs) They (laughs) They had a lot of rulers and competing cities, but Kalakmul's arch enemy was a city to the south called Tikal. They strategized and attacked, and ultimately, these two warring Mayan-era hubs couldn't work together, resulting in their eventual collapse later on in the centuries, when the Spanish came, for example. Surveys performed in the 1930s led to 103 stele found. Stele, I really hope I'm pronouncing that right, which are stone slabs or pillars, normally used in Mayan custom to keep record of a ruler's achievements. After that, the site was ignored, and it wasn't until 1982 when a project to investigate was spearheaded by the Universidad Autónoma de Campeche until 1994. Now, it has become a large-scale project for the National Institute of Anthropology and History. The core of Calakmul, its center, contains roughly 1,000 structures two of which are the pyramids, which themselves contain add-on structures. There's great evidence of causeways and canals and reservoirs, not to mention royal burials or tombs located among the murals and all the ceramic pieces. It's really a beautiful site. 
Kalakmul is open to the public, and it involves over an hour's drive from the nearest town. Wow. So you're out. You're in the middle of nowhere investigating yeah. this thing. Yeah. A lot of this stuff is quite in the middle of nowhere to what we are in today, right? It's very interesting how we've avoided, like, re, like restructuring these places for our own living, you know? Yeah. Some of them are. Some of them we do live in today, obviously. But a lot of them, most of them are not. Most of them are still, like, out there alone somewhere. Wow. Yeah. And these two warring factions of Mayans. Yeah. Uh, kind of wore each other down and then the Spanish were able to come in and just Yeah, but if they were together they probably maybe could have fought them off or at least put up a bigger fight. Wow. But you know, we all know the Spanish had a lot of shit though. They had a lot of people and a lot of weapons. Yeah. So maybe maybe it's all moot regardless. Who knows, right? Uh next up here is uh in the same not hemisphere, but the same rough continent, South America now. We're gonna talk about Caral, Peru. While great cultures were being established in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and China, there was another in the Americas at the same time, a peaceful city of Andean culture named Caral. Located 200 kilometers or 120 miles north of Lima, the capital of Peru, Caral is considered to be one of the oldest, if not the oldest, in the Americas. Founded in 2600 BC and abandoned a little before 2000 BC, Caral's urban complex spread out, spreads out over 320 acres and had a population of over 3,000 people. Discovered in 1948 by a man named Paul Cossack, it wasn't considered to be a great find because of a lack of the typical architecture and artifacts that are normally found in places like Guatemala and Mexico. It wasn't until 1975 that a Peruvian architect, Carlos Williams, took detailed record of the site that people gained interest in. Among the Peruvian desert and a skip away from the sea, people discovered an elaborate complex of temples, an amphitheater, and ordinary housing. The main temple, named Temple Mayor, is 150 meters long and 110 meters wide. Two things appealed to me, me Oscar, about Caral, Peru. The first is that archaeologists believe it was a peaceful society built on commerce and pleasure. That's how they wrote it. Really mm. weird. I don't know if that means something worse or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was no indication of weapons, mutilated bodies, or battlements. So that's usually a good sign for that. The second thing is a geoglyph. Found in the year 2000, the geoglyph is etched on the ground among circular stone lines near Caral. When traced out, the lines form uh, the design of a human face with long streaming hair and a gaping mouth. And Caral is currently open for the public for visitation. I think I've seen the, mm -hmm. the geoglyph you're referring to. And we've talked about geoglyphs in the past here. Yes, when we talked about uh, Serpent Mound up, up mm -hmm. in o Ohio when we went there. Yep. Um, yep. So I, I think I've seen that. Did you include a picture of this geoglyph? Oh, yes, yes, I Okay, did. so listeners, make sure and check the show notes to see what we're talking about. I'm also wondering, are these the same people that created the the Nazca lines? I don't think so. Oh, okay. I think those are different people. Um, okay. There's, there's several major uh, hubs back then, and this wasn't necessarily one of them. It was, and, this was like a middle tier area. Okay. Probably. Interesting. And I it's just, just – It's just the oldest. Yeah, yeah. I was, just, I was just curious, especially when you mentioned the geoglyph. I was like, oh, I wonder if – same people who did the lines. Yeah. Um, did, did it say what happened? Do you know what happened to the people? I'm sure I read it. I you know I, I purposely probably didn't include it because it was either similar to all the other ones or um, like I had to read a lot more to find out or it wasn't. I think it was just abandoned by like by time, like over time it just left. And Got it. No, no one discovered it again for a long time. But usually when it comes to those kind of things, if it's not a battle that wasn't recorded by the winners, a lot of these things we don't know for sure. Understood. And you're going to find out other examples where I get into that kind of thing. But I don't know offhand as to what happened to them. Gotcha. So I apologize for that. <laughs> they, should, they should pick up some battlements. Battlements, <laughs> right. Yeah, apparently they, they were totally peaceful. As usually, every, that's how people fall, because they're peaceful. Hmm. <sighs> Sad but true. Sad but true. Next up here, totally different area. We're going to Sanchi in the Madhya Pradesh. Whoa. This is a strange entry compared to the rest, because Sanchi wasn't really lost, just forgotten over time. 
as religion as religion in the area changed. It is the holy site, not the, but a holy site for Buddhism. Sanchi is in the Madhya Pradesh region of India, with construction beginning in the 3rd century BCE until the 12th century CE. A lot of building. Wow. Right? It's a long time building. Not like straight, by the way. It was like added on as we go. Um, since Western civilization tends to dictate what is or isn't in history or discovered, I'm forced to go by the following account. So what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. That's not really lost. People lived there knew about it. But since Western civilization didn't get there until a certain time, it wasn't considered discovered until then. And we live in the Western civilization. So right, right. it's hard. You know what I'm saying? This is where history gets muddled for me because it's all about the perspective. Right? So I mentioned that for, I mean, this is why I put it in here, actually. <laughs> anyway, uh, where am I? Right. Um, <laughs> General Henry Taylor, a British officer in the Third Maratha War, was the first to document Sanchi in 1818 in a state of abandon. The 19th century proved to be unfortunate for this site as British and French museums took slabs and pieces and gates from the temples. Sanchi is infamous for its great stupa. Stupa is a hemispherical structure containing relics that is used for that is used as a place of meditation. The great stupa is one of the oldest and best preserved structures in India and was commissioned by Emperor Ashoka, who ruled India from 268 to 232 BCE. Its nucleus was a hemispherical brick structure built over Buddhism relics with a raised terrace encompassing its base and railing and stone umbrella on the summit, symbolizing high rank. There are scores of information on the great stupas, as well as the other stupas built around it. The level of intricate artwork and unmolested relics in and around the structure has no shortage of significance and time period indicators. So much information, in fact, that each gateway and pillar has their own focused research and journal entries in the scientific community. Um, wow. Yeah. That one's really weird. There's a, there's a lot of information on this. I, got, like, I could have read one book on one of the gates alone if I wanted to. Obviously, I didn't. But So the information that are on these, uh, I'm assuming they're like tablet sort of things. Yeah, no, it's like a, a pillar would have like a, a pillar would be erected. That's that's either part or connected to a gate or whatever, or, or just separate. And that pillar would have so many edges in it, and and it's telling a story of when it was built, why it was built. You know, all these like it will have like the story of whatever Pharaoh wanted it. Not Pharaoh, that's not the right word. Whatever king commissioned it, and it would have all this grand story in it about something they did amazingly or whatever. Like everything would be something. Wow. Everything would mean something. Every wall, every gate, everything meant something. Everything told a story. It is literally like a, like a giant book. This it's temple, amazing. Temples. Yeah. And it's, it's lasted all this time. Yeah, yeah. That's why there's so much research on it. Um, that's why people have really enjoyed translating it. It's a very historian's, like, uh, wet dream, I guess. Got it. <laughs> yeah. All right, next up here, we're going to go to Egypt now. Ooh. Memphis, Egypt, not the other Memphis. Memphis. Oh, not, not Memphis, Tennessee? No, not Elvis um, Presley's. I forgot that thing. <laughs> I was going to say. Not Elvis Presley land. No, no. We're not going back to Beale Street, Oscar, not, you and I? Not. Oh. Remember that? I do. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Memphis was a city located just 20 kilometers or 12 miles south of Cairo on the west bank of the Nile River. By the way... <laughs> This is funny. This is just another aside. I typed in West Bank because I'm trying to write the west side of the bank. Yeah. Of the Nile River, not West Bank, like the West Bank. That's the city, right? That's in uh, uh, the Middle East somewhere. Middle East. Fuck. I, mean, I can't believe I just fucked that up. And whatever. I'm with drug, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I didn't study West Bank. And it wouldn't let me uncapitalize it. <laughs> <laughs> so in my notes it's capitalized when I'm just trying to say the west side of the fucking bank <laughs> so I'm just gonna say that <clears throat> it's like fuck. okay anyway the city marked a boundary between upper and lower Egypt during its heyday Memphis had 30,000 inhabitants becoming the largest settlement worldwide for a time between 1557 to 1400 BC this city was never really rediscovered 
Memphis, despite being abandoned by the 7th century AD, was always known about by the Middle East and Westerners later on. This city is a classic example of how big in stature something once was isn't anymore. Memphis touches on many historical figures and cities that is common knowledge today. Throughout eight straight dynasties, during what is called the Old Kingdom, old being capitalized, Memphis was the capital of Egypt, a thriving and influential <laughs> city indeed. Memphis was founded by King Menes, Menes, maybe? who was responsible for uniting the territories of Egypt, particularly the upper and lower half. This city served as a hub for make, to make that point, and additionally, Memphis was a great place for religion. In the sixth century, the city reached peak of prestige as, as a center of worship for Ptah, the god of artworks and creation. The Great Temple of Ptah, I think I'm mispronouncing that, by the way. I really hope I'm not. Anyway, the Great Temple of Ptah was the largest and most important monument in Memphis. Another, I'm sorry, not another, among other temples, such as the Temple of Ptah Ramses II and Temple of Hathor, some remains are left of the Temple of Ptah, but not enough to understand the full scope of its architecture. Unfortunately, this temple didn't survive as, as well as others. Mm. Besides its age and connections to rulers and empires like Alexander the Great, the Romans, Phoenicians, and great temples galore, Memphis also has great records and descriptions of foreign trading and travelers. Today, it's an open-air site where people can visit. Wow, I've never – Memphis, I'm, again, I don't know much about geography, but I've never heard of Men Memphis, Egypt, that, that's, and it being – such an important uh, central location there. Uh, yeah. Never heard yeah. of it. And those records help people connect a lot of dots as to who they traded with, who was big at the time, you know, shit like that. Yeah. Give, give historians a lot of information because not many people, not many civilizations kept records, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so they just didn't do it. It just wasn't done. You know, some places did, of course. We all know the Romans did, right? Yeah. But like not, not many places did. Awesome. Wow. Oh my God, this one, the name of this one. Oh my God. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Listeners. You ready I'm for so this? sorry. <laughs> it, it just sounds like it sounds funny. And I'm gonna I'm gonna explain why it's funny. Okay. Okay. The name of it is called Sukotash. Sukotash. It, it sounds like Succotash. Like it what? Does. So every time I wrote it, I kept laughing. So Sukotash, Thailand. Oh. And I really wish it was pronounced Sukothai. That's how it's written. But I, I read it. It's pronounced Sukatash. So I'm like, okay. Like it, it says, you know, so whatever. Sukatash, the capital of the city, Sukatash, in the Sukatash kingdom, <laughs> not to be confused with Sukatash province. No, of course not. No, no, of course not. Why would you? You would confuse that, right? You, yeah. The name of the current region this ancient city is a part of got its name in San, from Sanskrit. Suka, meaning happiness, and Udaya, I don't know what they got Udaya from, but Udaya, meaning rice. Rise or emergency. Sukhataj or Sukhadaya means dawn of happiness. Okay. I, I, I wanted to put that because dawn of happiness is a really cool name. But fuck, man. I don't understand why, how this works. But whatever. Sukhataj was the capital of a great kingdom that bled into areas like Thailand, Laos, Myanmar, and Malaysia. And was the first capital of si Siam. Siam, I am. I know. Sorry. That's the last time I make that joke. The Sukhataj kingdom was the cradle of civilization, the birthplace of Thai art, Thai architecture, and language. And it was around from 1238 to 1438 CE. As far as we're calling ancient cities like Memphis or Kalakmul, this city and kingdom is relatively newer, and its reign was less than others, for sure. It's probably the, the youngest city we're going to talk about. Okay. So, therefore, this city isn't lost or much of its old territory are used in the present day while its ruins are left for all to see. But here's where the history is fun. A consolid consolidation of Sukhotaj and other locations like, here it comes, C. Intratit paved way to making Thailand its size and influence in the region of the world today. This merging of cities helped the great little city of Sukhotaj defend against the Khmer Empire during its heyday. Sukhotaj flourished over the next 150 years, 
in large part due to its geographic location. Centered almost midway between Khmer Empire to the southeast and the Burmese Kingdom of Pagan to the northwest, Cosmo cosmopolitan Sukhothai thrived on commerce and patronage. Sukhothai and the neighboring city of C. Sachatanalia, no, I fucked that up. Such, no, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it's right. C. Sach, Sachanalai, fuck me, I'll, I'll go with that became centers in the production and exploration of ceramics throughout Southeast Asia. While somewhat similar to Khmer in stoneware or Vietnamese ceramics, the artisans of Sukhothai made pottery with a green glaze, which attracted widespread admiration and can be found uh, as far as present-day Indonesia and the Philippines. And I'm sure I've seen Nathan Drake break some of these ceramics. Who's Nathan Drake? You know who Nathan Drake is? Um, it's from a very famous franchise of video games called Uncharted. Oh, okay, okay. Have you heard of him? Uh, no, no, no. Uncharted? Wow, you're such an old fuddy daddy. You don't play games. Um, UNESCO, as mentioned before, declared Sukhothai and the neighboring ruins of Si Sachatanali and Kamfeng Fet as a single world heritage site in 1991. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, bravo in that section with those words, because no, I not bravo, not bravo. I fucked them up. I'm you fucked. you attempted. How about that? Because I would have scrapped the whole idea just on those words alone. I can't do this. <laughs> Fuck it. I think that's the hardest one, though. So I think it gets easier. Let's find out. There you go. <laughs> Let's find out. Okay. Um, next up here, we're going to Iran. Persepolis, mm. Iran. The name Persepolis is derived from ancient Greek as Perses and Polis which means the Persian city or the city of Persians. That said, Persepolis was part of the Achaemenid Empire, also called the first Persian Empire, which was an ancient Iranian empire based in Western Asia, founded by Cyrus the Great. The per the, the, Persepolis is situated in the plains of Mardasht, fuck, I hope I get that right, Mardasht, and surrounded by southern Zagros Mountains making it hard to locate if you don't know where to find it. And it is located 60 kilometers from the nearest modern city of Shiraz. Persepolis was founded somewhere in the 6th century BC. Dating reaches back to at least 515 BC. In the early 1930s, a French archaeologist, named a French archaeologist excavated Persepolis and was led to the conclusion of its date and while Cyrus the Great is the one that most likely picked the site for construction, it was actually Darius I who built the complex, the terrace, and the palaces. Unfortunately, what once stood on the man-made terrace, only a few pillars and what is called the Gate of All Nations remain. So not much remains. Besides the ruins, Persepolis is an interesting site because of its history and how little is known about its use. It is believed that while Darius I was ruler of Persia, Persepolis was the capital of his kingdom, but due to the city's location in such a remote and mountainous region, the true capitals were places like Susa, Babylon, and Ekbaktana. The function of Persepolis remains unclear to archaeologists. The grand ceremonial complex built there seemed to have served the kingdom primarily as a seasonal thing, not really able to become larger or become a war front or a commerce-inducing city. Because of eventual destruction the city faced, it is also unclear what other structures may or may not have e existed around the complex, leaving Persepolis to be named as a station or a compound rather than a city. It wasn't until Alexander the Great in 330 BC that other ancient civilizations even heard of Persepolis. Hmm and its immediate destruction and plundering, <laughs> because that's what he did. Wow. Today, UNESCO has the site open to the public. I, I so, wish I wasn't afraid of flying, because I, I would go check out a lot of these places. <laughs> <laughs> but you've flown before for jobs. So if I put a gun to your head, will you fly? Maybe then. Okay. Maybe then. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, these UNESCO sites, man, they would be I'll amazing. Talk your, I'll visit. talk to your boss. He's got to go to uh, Persepolis. He's got to go. <laughs> Persepolis. What's up? <laughs> Could he expense that? <laughs> yeah, could you, yeah. The gas card, will that take him far? <laughs> uh, 
anyway um so yeah it's yeah, i love that one because uh we, it's hard to tell why even they built the fucking city <laughs> it seems like so out of the way at the time and alexander the great was just an asshole and just fucking destroyed it <laughs> yeah he's like oh it looks good all the shit burn is it dying. all burn it all <laughs> right yeah you're gonna hear his name again for sure okay right. next up is a two for two for one. Oh. Mm -hmm. i'm gonna talk about two places called pompeii and herculaneum oh which, which is in italy of course yes we all know pompeii the ancient roman city that was entombed in ash by the sudden eruption of vesuvius pompeii lies in the province of naples campania italy yep. and was built around 40 meters or 130 feet above sea level on a coastal lava plateau created by earlier eruptions of mount vesuvius i don't know if that's funny or just ironic based on household accounts Pompeii had held the size of about 170 acres and was home to 20,000 people. Before becoming part of the Roman Empire, it was the Oscans. Sounds like my group, right? The Oscans. Sounds like Oscars. My, it was the Oscans who found the location. Who founded it. Sorry. Not founded, but founded it. Yes. Um, sorry. Right, words. They were an Italic people of Campania and Latium. Couple that with Greek and Phoenician influence over a short period of time, the god Apollo was introduced to the area as people used Pompeii as a safe port. Allies to the Romans, the Samnites, came and conquered that area, and Pompeii was, Pompeii was allowed to maintain linguistic and administrative autonomy under Rome. I don't know if you know this, maybe a lot of people do, but Rome tend to, when they conquer, they're like, okay, just pay us a tax, you could believe whatever you want. You know, there were usually they were cool about that. Not, every, not always, but usually no, they were cool. No. I mean, historically speaking, they kind of take that back a lot. But when they conquer, they tend to, you know, they weren't violent. They were like, you can keep believing whatever you believe. Mm. Just pay us, right? Yeah, that's how it was. During the Second Punic War, Pompeii remained faithful to Rome, which kept them overall unscathed. The city became an important passage for goods that, th that arrived by sea. Before that epic day in 79 AD, there was, a nut, there was a natural disaster, a warning shot of sorts by Mother Nature. In 62 AD, a severe earthquake hit Pompeii and smaller neighboring cities like Herculaneum and Nuceria. The earthquake caused fires, adding to the chaos. By 79 AD, Pompeii was able to rebuild nearly everything they lost. Ah. Uh. Mm-hmm. Of course, the two-day eruption of Vesuvius put an end to all of that. Many believe that it was the ash that killed the people, but a study made in 2010 led scientists to believe that it was the heat, not the ash, that killed the 1,150 people discovered so far. So far. So far, right. Wow. The exposure was 480 degrees. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. That hot pyroclastic lava at a distance of six miles from the vent of the mountain was sufficient enough to instantly kill Pompeii residents. Damn. Mm -hmm. Pompeii and nearby city Herculaneum, so this is a two-part entry, this is why I mentioned it, is special because we, got to see, we get to see today how people lived and what they were worried about during a disaster and how they cared about their loved ones, which is to say they did exactly as what we would do today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pompeii gets an average of 2.5 million visitors annually. Uh, wow. Yeah. But, but everyone knows Pompeii. I want to put a big one in there. It's probably the biggest one everyone knows. Yeah. I mean, you could still to this day see those bodies. Yes. I remember the the, the, the woman, right? And the dog and the, with the kid. And yeah, it's, it's, yeah I remember it, some of those images. And the fact that I did not know there were like I love the way you put it, Mother Nature's warning shots. Yes. Yeah. Prior to uh to yeah. to, to the, the day, the yeah. judgment day for Pompeii. Right. Um, Mother Nature selected Pompeii for extinction. I didn't, I didn't include, like that. I didn't include this little fact. Uh, I don't know why I didn't write it in. It's an interesting fact. But um when Mamba Series erupted, the first erupt, it was a two day thing. But it really wasn't until the majority of that, like way into that first day slash the second day when it was getting – like where people started dying. But that's why the, t the death toll is only over 1,000 because people were able to run away. 
a lot, most of them, most of the residents ran away. Most I was going to, I was going to ask about that because that was the other mm -hmm. thing I didn't realize that Pompeii was that large. You said 27,000, I think you said 20,000 people roughly. Right. I uh, didn't know it was that big of a, a city. Yeah. But so uh, many uh, of them got a chance to run away. Ah, okay. And the air got to 400 plus degrees. Yeah. 480. I think I said. That is, yeah, a, I can't even imagine what that is like. That's an oven. I mean, that's an oven when I'm making a pizza. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, right? that, that would cook your lungs instantly. I mean, yeah, you breathe that in, you're fucked. Horrible way to go. Horrible way to go. Definitely. And obviously the ash and that, be, that froze them in place. It just, so, it was just so instantaneous. It just, it's crazy. Yeah. I, I would love to know if there's uh, haunted stories coming from the city of Pompeii. I've never yeah. looked that up and I'm yeah. going to now. Uh, Might be something for sure, but I don't even know if people can like be there at night, things like that, where it's quiet. If it's always touristy, maybe there's never a chance for us to find out unless we're archaeologists that are allowed there at night when it's yeah. alone, something like that, right? It's the only time we could find out. Kind of like a, Very cool. a much bigger version of um, that ghost town in Nevada, right? Oh, Rhyolite, yeah. Rhyolite, yeah. Minus the bodies. Right. But we were there at night, so it made everything creepier for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up oh, here. Oh, good one. Yeah. 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 Next up, we're going to go to Greece now. And the name of the city is called Eliki. Now, it's pronounced, it's written like, he like. <laughs> <laughs> he like, yes. He like. Uh, but it's Eliki. <laughs> Thank God, because I don't think I can say he like all the time. Okay. Right. <clears throat> this ancient Greek city was a primary city in the region of Archaea in Greece. Not the capital, mind you, but a big, important seaside city like New York. Founded in the Bronze Age, the Bronze Age being 3000 BC to 1200 BC, Eliki, like other cities and towns that dwelled next to bodies of water, worshipped Poseidon pretty hardcore. While this city never raised a fuss to merit staying power in the modern times like Sparta or something like that, Eliki did manage to be powerful when active with trade routes, outstanding belief, and Homer, the writer of the Odyssey, Names che name checked Eliki as a participant in the Trojan War as part of Agamemnon's forces. Oh, okay. you know that movie where Brad Pitt did something. Do you know what's there? Waiting beyond that beach. Immortality. Take it. It's yours. <laughs> <laughs> where he did things. He did things. It's Panhellenic temple and sanctuary of Heliconian Poseidon were known throughout the classical world, second only in religious importance to Delphi. Pretty big deal back then. Poseidon, however, did not seem to like the tributes made in his name because Eliki, in Greece, has been called the real-life version of Atlantis. In the winter of 373 BC, a tsunami hit the coast of Eliki, submerging the city to its watery grave. Oh, wow. Historians believe that an earthquake that accompanied the tsunami is what made the disaster so potent. Add another earthquake that was followed by a tsunami on August 23rd, 1817, in the same spot. And you've got confusion among archaeologists as to where this city currently rests. It wasn't until 2001 that people found Eliki, nestled in an ancient lagoon, and found all the proof in 2012 when telltale clay roofs and Poseidon engraved coins were found. No one can visit without special skills and passes. Many say that Plato, that Plato, who first wrote about Atlantis, came up with it based on Eliki, Greece. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, all of it had no idea. So, so it's, under, it's submerged today. Yes. So to see it, you're diving. Yes. Oh, wow. Other pictures are probably for this one or underwater pictures. So they think Eliki was the inspiration for the Atlantis story. Yes. Oops. <laughs> did, that get, did, that get the, did that get on the carpet? What was it? It was your mom. No, it was nothing. It was nothing. Okay. Um, so they think Eliki was the inspiration for Atlantis, mm -hmm. that Eliki might be the real Atlantis. Yes. Oh, wow. Great. In fact, Eliki kind of makes a section within this section. So you're going to find out a, a common occurrence here. Oh, okay. Here, which is to my next one here. Next one is called Port Royal in Jamaica. Port, 
Iron Man, Jamaica Boomba Clot. Yeah, this is this is why you're not allowed there. Uh, Port Royal. <laughs> been there three times. <laughs> You've been there three times, right? Have you seen Port Royal? I have not seen Port Royal, no. Have you heard of Port Royal? No, no, I haven't. Oh, here's why. <laughs> Thanks. You, you gave me a great layup there. That's great. I just wanted you to. There's no way you can visit. There's nothing exists. Okay. Here's... And I ruined it by explaining it, of course. So there you go. Okay. Good. A serious face. Yeah. Port Royal was a village located in the mouth of Kingston Harbor in the southeastern oh. side of Jamaica. Yeah, Kingston. I've been to Kingston. Yeah, it's right next to Princeton. That's where Bob Marley's from. <laughs> oh, sure. I don't know shit about Jamaica. It's true. Okay, uh, Jamaica, much like other island states and countries in the Caribbean, was always a victim of larger, to larger man, land masses like the U.S., England, and Spain. Port Royal became important later on in its life, but before English occupation, Port Royal used to be called Cague or possibly Caguaya. The Native Americans that occupied Jamaica came up with the name, but Caguay was only used for fishing expeditions, like a fishing spot not a village or a town yet. Under the leadership of Christopher Columbus, the Spanish landed on Jamaica in 1494. Settlement occurred in 1509 while searching for new lands and resources like gold and silver. They love their fucking gold and silver. I the Spanish. Too. No, I know. But the Spanish were really greedy assholes about it. Uh, the Spanish did not deem it necessary to change the name of this fishing spot, so it, still, it stayed Caguay during their stay. The town was captured later on by England in 1655 during the invasion of Jamaica. By 1659, 200 houses, shops, and warehouses had been built around the fort in the newly named Port Royal. There were five forts that defended that port. At one point, these add-ons made Port Royal the largest city in the Caribbean. Oh. At one point it was. Definitely not today. There are two fascinating aspects of Port Royal. You're going to love this one, Jay. The first is that Port Royal was pirate land. Arr. Literally. Literally. Yeah, literally. Arr, give me rum. Right. Swashbuckling pirates would use Port Royal as a safe passage between expeditions. By expeditions, oh. you mean, you know, thief fucking robbery runs. They make it sound so uh, educational. The expeditions. Yeah. No, 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 no. They, they, they were, were robbing motherfuckers. The they were robbing. They were boat jacking motherfuckers. <laughs> right. They were the original dry buyers. Yeah. Um, just in a huge ship. Pirates that had settled in Port Royal and were typically known for robbing Spanish ships became legal in the eyes of England and became privateers, which just means legal pirate. That just means legal pirate. That's all it means. Wow. Uh, it's like the difference between being a serial killer and then working for the CIA wet team or something. Um. Well, sorry, it's no, it works. It works. Too political. <laughs> this led to Spain having to defend their property instead of being on the offense and instead of retaking their lands. Pirates also enjoyed Port Royal because of how close to shipping lanes it was, which made ships easy prey. Imagine a pornographic NC 17 version of the Pirates of the Caribbean blockbuster franchise. The only thing those movies seemingly got right is how dirty everyone was. <laughs> just filth. I mean, just yeah, filth. Right. Port Royal was labeled as a pirate utopia as England's grip on the people lessened and lessened and were replaced more and more by <clears throat> entrepreneurs. I like to quote unquote. Yeah. It was called the Sodom of the New World where a person living in Port Royal was either a pirate, cutthroat, or prostitute. Wow. What the fuck is a cutthroat? Is that an occupation? <laughs> I guess so. Just, I guess uh, so. Yeah. The second fascinating aspect of Port Royal is the earthquake that devastated most of its northern region. On June 7th, 1692, Port Royal was utterly hobbled, never to regain its former slimy glory. <laughs> Forts James and Carlisle sank, not to mention many houses and some buildings. While Jamaica experienced the earthquake as a whole, Port Royal got hit the hardest. It was made worse by a tsunami that followed, because the earthquake with water tends to make a tsunami. Right. Nearly half of the population of Port Royal died, either by the quake, the tide, or sickness. Oh, man. A, a good source to see what sank and its current state 
is a show on the National Geographic channel titled Wicked Pirate City. I'm definitely going to check that out. I'm definitely going to check that out. Yeah, and that's my Port Royal entry. So it's like uh, <laughs> if you're a religious person, uh, this Sodom, right, as you mm-hmm. said, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. a deity, the power yeah. that, that the power <laughs> that is, said yeah. no more. No more. Right, no more. Wow. So uh, a huge portion of it. Essentially, this is another underwater one. It sank underwater. Pictures in the show notes? I think so. I, they should be all underwater, yes. Okay. I think one or two of them are. I'm I think they all are. They all are. They all are, yeah. You know me. If it has to do with water, I'm in. Oh, I know you're in. And there's two more. So this is, like I said, like a short segment within the segment of underwater stuff. You'll like it. You're going to love it, especially the last one. It's kind of fun. All right. So here's the next one. Alexandria, Egypt. This is another odd entry. Alexandria is a currently active and major city. But in ancient times, while not as large, Alexandria had more coast than it has today. That's right. It's another underwater city. Or at least a portion of a city. Not unlike Port Royal. Founded in 331 BC by Alexander the Great, he wanted a great Greek city in the name of his name that will be a powerhouse by putting in a position of two great harbors, envisioning a causeway to an island not far off named Pharos. Alexandria is famous for being the home of Queen Cleopatra, was named as the world's greatest city by the Romans, and traded in every ancient commodity and boasted 700,000 scrolls in its library. Wow. I'm not going to get into the city history too much because the city is very much alive still. And going to move on to the underwater stuff because I know that's what you want. And I know that's what everyone wants once a year. <laughs> yeah. so we just get to it. Just 20 meters under the surface of the Mediterranean Sea lies the ruins of the ancient royal city. Over 1,600 years ago, an earthquake changed the city forever. The lighthouse that was once one of the world's seven wonders sank just off the coast. Some of the great finds, such as the golden jewelry, the massive head of Cleopatra's nemesis, Octavian, have since been hauled and placed in museums today. The world's first skyscraper may have existed in Alexandria. Hmm. Divers discovered a structure that rose from a vast rectangular base topped by a smaller octagonal section, then a cylindrical section culminating in a huge statue, statue, most likely Poseidon or Zeus, scholars say that this pharaoh statue, completed by 283 BC, dwarfed all other human structures of its era. Great palaces also fell into the water, including Cleopatra's Grand Palace, which is said to, which is said where she spent her last days with Antony. It's a mm. major history there. There's also the statue of a priest to the goddess Isis and a sphinx with the face of King Ptolemy the 12th. All of this and more just off the coast, which you can see on a clear day. You can see it? On a a clear day. Yeah, on a very clear day, you can see parts of the ruins from above water. Yeah, I read that somewhere. So interesting. So cool. I forgot to give you the sign, but yeah, I'm done with that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Here's the other one. We're almost done with the section. It's still the first session, by the way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next one here. We're going to go to China. Xichang, China, to be precise. This entry is the final underwater entry, and it has interesting differences from all of the other ones like Eliki or Port Royal. The city of Xichang was established over 1,300 years ago during the Eastern Han Dynasty, which ruled from 25 to 200 AD. Xichang stands for Lion City, and it came from the name of the mountain that beautifully rests nearby, Wuxi Mountain, which means Five Lion Mountain. I love that name. The also gorgeous lake that Xi Cheng is on is called hmm, Qiandao Lake, which means Thousand Island Lake. These are my favorite names, by the way, of the whole thing. (laughs) These are my favorite names. (laughs) All of it. I love how they name this stuff. What isn't favorable is how Xicheng City used to live and when it lived above the water. I have no idea. I realized that only educated guesswork was required to understand Xicheng with the rise and fall of the aforementioned Eastern Han Dynasty. Points to China once more for keeping a country 
for being a country, sorry, for being a country that keeps a lot of information close to the chest because they don't, I don't know why, what the city was there for. Huh. I, have, I have no idea. I, <laughs> I just like, China doesn't really share to anyone. I don't tell yeah. us anything. So we don't know. So I wanted to thank the Mongol Empire for that one. Um, <clears throat> now, we do know why Xichang City lies underwater, but it wasn't a disaster or warfare. It was intentional. The city and the valley were deliberately flooded in 1959 in order to create an artificial lake and hydroelectric and a hydroelectric power station. Oh, okay. Xichang is a diver's paradise. Surprisingly, the city hasn't eroded much, and the buildings and walls and wooden details remain. The depth for this ancient city is 26 to 40 meters. According to a restored map of Lion City, you can find one city gate, one city gate tower on each city gate, and altogether there are five towers. Besides them, six streets in Xichang City were used to connect every corner of the city as a whole. Remember Qiandao Lake? That lake is man-made and Xicheng City a volunteered sacrifice for energy proficiency in that region of China. Wow. Mm -hmm. To this day, there are almost 300 arches still standing beneath the waves in addition to a great number of intact buildings. Somehow, and baffling to some, some scientists out there, the submerging became a net positive for the preservation of the city than it would have been with the damaging sun and wind. It's so truly a spectacle to watch. The sea is preserving it. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, better than huh. better than the being of a plan would be. That's really weird. All right, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Xi Cheng. Yeah. You go. I wonder uh, what it would be like to to dive the streets, enter yeah. buildings. I mean, wow! How it's got to be cool and creepy at the same time. Yeah. It, yeah. It should, yeah. That makes me want to be a mermaid. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Oh my god. All right. Here's oh my god, here's a big one. This is the last one, I think, of this segment. Now we're gonna go to Carthage, Tunisia. Have you heard of Carthage? Well, I thought Car Carthage, Greece, right? No, Carthage, Tunisia. Yeah, oh, I, I oh, haven't there. But I didn't like research the history of the country, so maybe it was a part of Greece at one point, but not not in this case. Okay. Um, but let's go to it. This is a big one. Carthage was the capital of the Carthaginian Empire which lasted from 814 BC to 146 BC in what is Tunisia today. Carthage was a major com blah, 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 sorry. Carthage was a major commercial and maritime power that quite simply dominated the western Mediterranean region. Carthage had had a, had a notion of citizenship distinguishing those in society who could participate in the political process and who had certain rights, privileges and duties. I know duty. They almost exclusively held the Punic religion all to themselves. And you may wonder, Punic, you mentioned, you mentioned, Oscar's mentioned that before. You're going to find out why. I won't get into this religion in detail, but the fact that, but the fact that this, that it's a religion still known about today should say how influential Carthage used to be. Carthage was originally founded by Phoenician settlers, gained independence in 650 BC, and had their own culture and currency called Carthaginian shekel and had more than 30,000 inhabitants. Unfortunately, little evidence exists on Carthage. What is known through records and archeological findings on other ancient locations, I mean, from them, not on, is that, is that the Carthaginian civilization was far more complex, nuanced and progressive than previously believed. Its vast and lucrative commercial network touched almost every corner of the ancient globe, from the British Isles to Western and Central Africa. Big deal back then. They didn't have no planes or phones, guys. Their magnitude and gravitas, the legacy and growth Carthage should have had, is what led to their downfall. Carthage was a target too juicy to avoid. Carthage and Greece fought for trading routes, posts, and settlements all over the place. The Greeks were undermining Carthage's monopoly. It's like Apple versus, you know, the other one, Android. Um, okay. You know, think of it that way. But, you know, Greece, who was a powerhouse, obviously, they, 
Carthage totally, you know, and my point is that they were huge, huge ones against each other. Anyway, so the Greeks were undermining Carthage's monopoly. This began the Sicilian Wars from 9th to 8th century BC. Remember, Sicily wasn't part of Italy back then, I don't think. It was a different thing altogether, but it was, you know, off the coast of Italy for sure. Carthage never fell, never, I'm sorry, Carthage never fell, but it did result in losing some land in Sicily to Greece and failed to gain that commercial maritime monopoly. And then another, you had another war like the Pyrrhic War and fighting of Berber invaders kept Carthage a cool customer and hard to take down. Cut to the Punic Wars, 254 to 146 BC. This is the epic fight between two great powers, the Carthaginians and the Romans. Based on how little we know of Carthage, it's obvious who won. There were three Punic Wars. And what's fascinating about the whole ordeal is that this fight was a real moment for future generations. All of what we know of, Western civilization would have completely changed if Carthage had won, and they almost did. They had an amazing maritime fleet and stood ground and won way more battles against the Romans than you might think. Hannibal, the great Carthage, Carthaginian general <laughs> that is known and often referenced in pop culture and history books, became a legend through the Punic Wars. After the Second Punic War, though, you could see how Carthage was going to lose another fight against the Roman Empire. But history has taught us that they never let anyone slide. They came back and decisively destroyed and burned Carthage to the ground. This swift Roman justice and archaeological injustice is what we know is why we know so little about Carthage. The only reason we know so much about these wars is because Rome kept great records on their end. History is indeed written by the winner and its oppressor. Yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, I like the way you said, well, we know who won that war because yeah. we don't know yeah. shit about Carthage. Uh, very mm -hmm. true. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Rome, Rome really fucked them up. So really. what, is it, what is it now? Just an archaeological site? It's, that's it's it. a site. Yeah, it's a site that not much is there. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's stuff there for sure. Pictures, guys. But like, yeah, it's not like nothing standing worth, you know, nothing like other things last, you know, no, nothing lasted very, very much there at all. Wow. Yeah. And the uh, entire population, you know, Phoenicians, when they left Phoenicia, which was a huge powerhouse back then, now it's long gone to history. Um, it was, uh, it just, it was humongous and the Romans wanted it. Yeah. And yeah. it was because of their involvement with the Greeks, actually. Um, those Greek wars, Sicilian wars led to a lot of land and a lot of like people talking, you know what I'm saying? About like, hey, have you heard of this Carthage place? You know, so wow. you can imagine seeing it that way. Okay. So uh, Carthage ends the first segment of this episode. <laughs> Bad news is that there are four more. <laughs> only two move, only two more on this part of the show. The good news is that it's the longest segment out of the five. Longest and entries anyway. If any of these light touches on history remains baffling to you as to why it's on the SOS, then I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to listen again. Listen closely. It's easy to imagine the first list of cities as unnecessary, places we could have lived without. It's true for a few, but certainly not all of them or even half. I wanted to hit a whole spectrum of populaces throughout history that are from household names to something old being something new to you. If anyone out there has been envisioning or trying to envision these locations as people, then you're closer to my machinations than you think. The next segment I've titled Cities Once Hidden. <laughs> It'll be painfully obvious to you once I get going again. Look for a simple connection between these locations that isn't just a title. And again, pictures. Pictures in the show notes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start off with Derinkuyu, Turkey. Derinkuyu is a town located in, in the central, not southeastern, Anatolia region of Turkey. In ancient times, the region within Anatolia was called Cappadocia. I really hope I'm saying that right. Or I'm just, maybe I'm just putting Italian flair to it. I have no idea. 
The Rinkuyu comes from Cappadocian Greek, meaning deep well. The oldest written source about the Rinkuyu comes from a book titled Anabasis, ancient Greece's most famous book by professional soldier slash mercenary Xenophon. Have you heard of Xenophon? Why does it sound familiar? Xenophon, maybe. Um, he's a super famous guy, apparently, you know. Um, well, I'm about to say it anyway. Xenophon, the, the book, Anabasis, it tells the story of the expeditions he and his large army of Greek mercenaries hired by Cyrus the Younger embarked upon. They murdered. They were murderers, basically. They were just really horrible people. <laughs> and he wrote a book about it. <laughs> there are seven books that make up the Anabasis, and they were composed by 370 BC. In it, he talks about visiting the people of Anatolia that they had excavated their houses underground, living well in accommodations large enough for the family, domestic animals, and supplied of store food. All underground. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh. I'm talking about an underground city, and it's way, may, it's way more complex than the Mall of America. <laughs> the first, <laughs> this first entry of the city's once hidden segment is actually the biggest one, and it's still used today. A 2010 census has a population of Derinkuyu and the rest of the district, all underground, by the way, at 22,114 people. Wow. Over 10,000 in Derinkuyu alone. It's a heavy tourist attraction for its large, multi-level underground city. The region of Cappadocia has several historical underground cities carved out of a unique geological formation. Though mostly unoccupied, there are over 200 underground cities, at least two levels deep, that have been discovered between Kayseri and Nefshir, with about 40 of those having at least three levels. Three levels deep. At least, yeah. How the hell did they get down there back then? <laughs> I, I mean, what were they doing? <laughs> what were they doing hiding? Uh, throughout the Byzantine era, Cappadocia was used as a refuge from raids and armies. They were basically Turkey's Helms Deep. You know? Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. The Rinkuyu managed to protect themselves from the Umayyad Ar Arab armies, Mongolian incursions, and more. Because of how the region of Cappadocia was, people added kitchens, stalls, churches, ventilation shafts, schools, and wine to the expansions from 4th century till 1923. It's a real-life testimony of hunkering down. I'd say. So what, these these uh, invading forces would come in and it would just look like a... Yeah, well, there's a horizon land. and it's a barren land, yeah. Up. Wow. And it's still used to this day. That's amazing. Yep. I've seen pictures. I want to go there so bad. <laughs> I really want to visit Turkey. I just wish the people were cooler. Um, <laughs> I hear really bad things about Turkey. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, they don't listen to podcasts. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, obviously. I'm just fucking with them. <laughs> Well, they had the oldest site in the world, and they had this underground city also. You know, it was pretty cool. Oh, that was very cool. Very cool. All right. Now we're going to move on to here, and I'll stop making fun of the Turkish people. Um, Machu Picchu, yes. Peru. Now, you've heard yeah. of this one, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, this yeah. Is pretty famous. 2,430 meters above sea level, on a crest of a mountain, lies one of the greatest Incan cities left for all to see. Machu Picchu is technically an Incan citadel made in the 15th century, and it's in southern Peru. Both the mountain and the Incan ruins are called Machu Picchu. Just, you know, don't get confused by that. <laughs> this sacred place was built by two great Incan rulers named Pachacutec Inca Yupanqui mm. and Tupac Inca Yupanqui. Did you say Tupac? I did. Tupac. That's probably why his mom got the name for him. Wow. Uh, the, the former, the former meaning pa Pachacutec, the former ordering the construction initially as a royal estate for himself, perhaps as a prize after successful after a successful military campaign, but we don't know for sure. The site is roughly divided into an urban and an agricultural section. Upper town is where the temples rest and the warehouses are in lower town. Something in the neighborhood of 200 buildings are arranged, sophisticated channel systems for irrigation, stone stairways set in the walls, and much more. All of this architecture was adapted to the very mountain itself. The city sits in a saddle between two mountains, actually. Machu Picchu, of course, and Huayna Picchu. 
If you haven't guessed as to what makes Machu Picchu a city once hidden, it's in the crook of two mountains. This crown jewel of the Incans was safe from harm over the centuries, even after Spain invaded the country slash continent. They never knew of its existence. Hmm. From royal citadel to refuge, Machu Picchu became as extraordinary in how it was hidden from the world as the views are beautiful. It wasn't until an American historian in 1911 that the world finally found out about Peru's hidden secret. UNESCO declared it a World Heritage Site in 1983, and from the internet poll they did in 2007, Machu Picchu was voted as one of the new seven wonders of the world. You know, that's something we, maybe we should do that uh, uh, podcast on just the seven wonders of the world. Is it still just seven? Is that what it is? It's, it's I still assume because it's in the title, right? <laughs> seven wonders of the world. I thought it changed for some reason. I thought it changed. But, 14, uh, 14 wonders. Got it. Okay. Well, yeah, a lot of yeah. the ancient wonders, right, are just gone now. Some of them, anyway. And maybe that's what it is. There's ancient wonders and there's modern wonders of the yeah. world. I think there's yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, about Machu Picchu. I also think I feel like Machu Picchu has a again ancient alien connection, but I, I could be wrong. Oh, I'm sure there's something. I'm that. sure. And maybe, maybe uh, I, I didn't get too far into it. I just wanted straight facts on it. But I know that um, it's possible that these are people responsible. Some of them being about the geoglyphs. Maybe, maybe they're the lines. responsible. The lines, right? The lines. The Nazca lines. Okay. Mm-hmm. They might be responsible, but not a hundred percent. Now. I'm going to move on here, something a little closer, and this is another two-parter. It's uh, Lagunita and Temchen in Mexico. Once again, we head to the Yucatan Peninsula to visit dual ancient Mayan cities. The sites of Lagunita and Temchen were visited in the 1970s by a Swiss archaeologist who came up with the Lagunita name. Both cities are located in the Calakmul Biosphere Reserve. the largest tropical forest reserve in Mexico. The sites were found through aerial photographs and even then hard to find within the trees. Both Temchen and Lagunita are large sites featuring pyramid temples, stele, plazas, and other structures. Temchen means deep well, which references the over over 30 large well-like holes used to collect rainwater. It is most likely that Temchen is older than Lagunita, indicated by features surrounding it dating as early as 250 AD. Now, the, that archaeologist, the, sorry, that archaeologist, archaeologist, sorry, was named Eric von Yu, like Yu, I don't know, who documented several stone monuments and an extraordinary facade in the entrance, preserving, representing, sorry. And with an entrance representing open jaws like an earth monster. But the results of his work were never published. His drawings were kept at Harvard University, but the exact location of the sites were a mystery. Because of the heavy, dense forest, these ancient sites weren't officially discovered until August of 2014. Wow, that's recent. Yeah. You want to talk hidden? There's little out there in nature that can hide monuments as well as this rainforest and these sites. Unfortunately, because Lagunita and Campeche were just discovered so recently, not enough is known yet about carbon dating and proper history. This is a legit lost city that foretells grand stories. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, And by the way, Lagunita, great beer. Yes. Great beer. Well, I mean, I don't think so, but I know you like it. Yeah, I do. I do. That's right. It is a famous beer. Mm-hmm. Probably another famous city or town somewhere. It sounds like a cop, a normal town name, right? I go need it. All right. Here's the next one. This is the last one of this uh, of this particular segment. <clears throat> Mesa Verde, USA. Mesa Verde. Okay. All right. Do you know it? I believe Arizona. Uh, no. Well, well, well guess, that's good. No, guess, no, guess not. <laughs> no, not Arizona. Um, not too far, but not not Arizona. Our first and only U.S. entry. Mesa Verde is located in Montezuma County, Colorado. Oh, okay. Its full name is actually Mesa Verde National Park. And in English, Mesa Verde translates to green table, but it means green plateau. I mean, in Spanish. I don't know why I put English. Um, President Theodore Roosevelt created that park to preserve the iconic cliff dwellings in 1906. Sometimes referred to as the Anazazi, 
Mesa Verde was built by the ancient Pueblo people approximately from 600 to 1300 AD. Definitely one of the oldest, if not, if not the oldest site in our country. It is hard to determine why the ancient Pueblo people left the site, but the best guess archaeologists have is that the crops became a real problem to keep in that area. So they scattered over time, far and wide. You know, they scattered to the point where they became the Hopi Native Americans in, in Arizona and or established the Rio Grande Pueblos of New Mexico. There are over 400 archaeological sites and over 600 cliff dwellings of the Pueblo people in Mesa Verde. These cliff dwellings are the special thing that puts Mesa Verde on this list. While not as well hidden as some of the other entries on this list, Mesa Verde's cliff dwellings are amazingly well built. You can only find the city from the correct angle. In fact, in 1776, when Mexican Spanish missionaries were seeking a route from Santa Fe to California, they passed by and noted the nature of Mesa Verde but failed to see the structures and cliff dwellings. It wasn't until the mid 1800s that people took notice, made treaties and began preserving the sites. Anyone and everyone can visit these ruins today. I've seen pictures of this. I've, yeah. I've seen this. It looks like super hidden, honestly. Yeah, it almost looks like a honeycomb in the side mm -hmm. of the, the, the mesa. Yeah, yeah, the mountain. plateau. Yeah, plateau. Um, very cool. Did not know that it was hidden from a certain angle. You know, you, you had to look it's at it. For a, I was in it for a long time, for sure. And it's crazy. And when it, it wasn't battles. It was themselves who left. It was just hard to upkeep everything, and they left. They just left it there. They said, peace. Mm -hmm. We're out. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but it looks really cool. It looks really cool. Yeah, um, it does. It does. Check the show notes. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, include, I think they're all aerial shots establishing of the place. Great. Um, that ends the short and sweet second segment of our program. The single U.S. entry really emphasizes how young we are as a country. It doesn't get older than Mesa Verde, and we've changed a lot in the country. Everything is just newer here. That said, if you are wanting some more U.S. entries, you won't be disappointed. Part two will cover some cool stuff. The third and final segment for this episode is titled Cities of Magical Realism. <laughs> Anok Kukurash Shar Kishati Sharu Rabu Sharu Dan Shar Babi Shar Bakshu Sounds strange for a title of a group of cities, but here's a theoretical example. Theoretical, mind you. If the if the lost city of Atlantis was recently discovered, I would include it on this list. Something that was legend and becomes true or proven to be real, at least a little bit, is what I'm going for. Ooh, I'm excited. Let's get to it. Yes. <clears throat> Dwarka, India. Dwarka is a city and municipality of the Bhumi Dwarka district in Gujarat state in northwestern India. It is an active city and was never a lost city. Dwarka is considered to be a holy city well known for its temples and, and as a pilgrimage center for Hindus. Dwarka means gateway, and it is believed to have been the capital of Gujarat in its heyday. Dwarka was built at least earlier than 574 AD based on copper inscriptions, but an exact time period is hard to discern. Since Dwarka is a port city, it had its share of fruits and conquests. The city is known not just for the history, but for the landmarks as well. There are two main temples, Dwarka Disha Temple and, Ruki, and Rukimi Devi Temple, as well as a holy island just off the coast called Bet Dwarka, like Dwarka Bet. No, Bet Dwarka. Uh, what is legendary about Dwarka? You're like, why is this in here? What is legendary about Dwarka is that it is strongly believed that it was the original, it, that it was originally the capital of the Dwarka kingdom, which belonged to Krishna. Krishna oh. is a deity of Hinduism right. and a fan of George Harrison by now. <laughs> nice. You like that one. You like that Good one. Beatles reference. You're I'm absolutely so glad, right. I'm, I'm so glad I'm old, by the way. I would never get that reference today. He is worshipped as the eighth avatar of Vishnu and is the god of tenderness, compassion, and love. According to legend, 
Krishna settled here after he defeated and killed his uncle Kansa. Then, once Dwarka and Betwarka were established, Krishna conducted the administration of his kingdom from the city while residing with his family on the island. It is believed that the great landmark Dwarkadisha Temple was built over 2,500 years ago. I know it. The reason Dwarka merits, albeit barely, a spot on this list is because of how history treated this port city and what history has taught us. For example, in 1241, Muhammad Shah invaded Dwarka and damaged the temple. In 1473, Sultan Mahmud Begada sacked the city and destroyed the temple outright. It wasn't until 1861 that renovations on Dwarka Disa temple were done. Unable to provide adequate proof of inscriptions and carbon dating. That's the unfortunate thing. While I don't believe that a god made the city per se, I have seen how legend is born out of great and influential people. Huh. So that's where Krishna supposedly mm -hmm. took up reign on earth. Yeah. yeah. Man, how cool. Yeah. Is there Jesus Christ? Yeah, pretty much. And he was a real person. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I think, I, I think of it that way. Um, but I didn't include Jesus Christ on this list. He's not on this list, guys. Um, but I'm just saying. <laughs> He's just too popular. Um, now, moving on here. Uh, Ciudad Perdida, Colombia. Okay. This city was too much fun to pass up. <laughs> Believed to have been found around 800 CE, Ciudad Perdida is located in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta region in Colombia. Ciudad Perdida in Spanish means lost city, literally means lost city. It's not El Dorado because that's supposed to be in, in the Amazon, but Ciudad Perdida very nearly became a golden lost city. Oh, Firstly, two local indigenous groups such as the Oraco, the Corgis, and the Wiwas have always known and visited the land over the centuries. They kept the knowledge to themselves until it was discovered in the 1970s. Ciudad Perdida consists of a series of 169 terraces carved into the mountainside, a net of tiled roads and small circular plazas. The city and surrounding areas housed 2,000 to 8,000 people. It was actually the Kogi and the Tairona people that traded and resided in that area back then. Enter the fucking Spanish conquistadors in 1514. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me laugh. Uh, their penchant for enslavement, pillaging, and violence was simply awful for the people living there. They forced their language and religion on the people and, of course, wanted gold above all else. The Kogi and Tairona people, in particular, fought the Spanish very well for about 100 years. By the end, sometime in the, fi sometime in the 1500s, the Tairona were forced to flee their soon-to-be-lost city. This scattering ensured the safety of many of the Tairona, but not their customs and culture. They, like many tribes, tried appeasing the Spanish with their gold idols that they had and built and the pieces, but it was never enough, never enough for them. Their neighbors, the Kogi, did manage to stay in the area and actually did their very best at reappropriating Tairona's culture into their own. They always believed that they successfully buried some of their artifacts in Ciudad Perdida. And because the Spanish never set foot there, it became lost. Let's jump to 1972. It wasn't some American traveling or a surveyor or a junior archaeologist that discovered Ciudad Perdida. It was a group of treasure hunters. Oh. Or, or I should really say looters, really. And they were named Los Sepulvedas that founded Ciudad Perdida. They named the area Green Hell. Los Sepulvedas were a hunting were hunting, sorry, a turkey when they found a set of stairs that led into the city. For years after the discovery by the looters, treasures from the site, which included gold figures and ceramics, began appearing on the black market. After a murder on the site of one of the group's members and more black market sales, archaeologists headed down there. This is 1976 now, and from then and from that point till 1982, they managed to reconstruct discover more, and preserve. About 40% of the sites in Sierra Nevada have been explored only. Only 40%. Wow. So the, the El Dorado connection is this mm -hmm. buried 
the buried gold statuary mm-hmm. and, and figures. Right. And right. so was it a massive amount that they found of gold? No, because they gave most of them to the Spanish back then. Uh, but at the time, massive oh, yes. amounts of gold and, there. Enough to appease them from not being attacked outright. So for that long, as, as long as they lasted. There's the El Dorado connection. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. And, and how cool is Green Hell? Green Hell remind me of Green Inferno. Uh, yeah, I the say movie. that because, right. And I say that because that's about uh, the lost civilizations living in the Amazon. And this isn't the Amazon, but this is something like it. And I love how they called it Green Hell. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And the Misfits have a song called Green Hell. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's an awesome song. Is it about this place or this area? Uh, I don't remember the lyrics off the top of my head, but mm-hmm. I doubt it. Maybe okay. they come on, yeah. come on, Google that. Yeah, <laughs> Google, Google it if you like the Misfits. Google it, bitch. Great oh, yeah. song. Just can't think of the lyrics right now. It's late. Yep. Yeah, it is late. Okay. Uh, here's the next one. Yunaguni Jima, Japan. Much like Japan itself. Do you know this one? Yunaguni? Uh, yeah, I've heard of this. I've, I feel like I've researched this for something. Really? Okay. You know, it does. Uh, it's, it's, just... it's, it's a lot of fun. This is a lot of fun. Okay, go for it. Let me see. Uh, much like Japan itself, this is an island entry. Yunaguni Jima is in the Okinawa prefecture in the region of Kyushu in the westernmost inhabited island of Japan and lies 108 kilometers slash 67 miles from the coast of Taiwan in the East China City Sea. Sorry. I mentioned all of this because up until the 2010s, these three countries fought for sovereignty on the island before Japan won out. This is a strange island, and it will remind you of some legends in certain pockets of humanity. After gaining independence in the 1940s, Yonaguni-jima was occupied by the U.S. from 1945, I wonder why, to Mm -hmm. 1972. Mm -hmm. It was given to Okinawa, and after an earthquake in 1988, China, Taiwan, and Japan fought over it. Now, let's go to a deeper path now. Earlier history is vague. An educated guess being that a human migration from Taiwan to Yonaguni may have happened. The first written account came from a Korean document in 1477, which talked about fishermen from a Korean province who drifted there. Nearly the rest of what we know of, of Yonagunajima, comes in the form of mythical and cultural references. This island was called Nyogo no Shima, which associates with the myth of the island of women. Ooh. This goes as far back as the Edo period, which is 1603 to 1868, if not farther. The myth is what it sounds like, an island entirely inhabited by women. Yonagunijima appears at the end of a 1682 book titled The Life of an Amorous Man (laughs) and 1807's Strange Tales of the Crescent Moon. There's more than literary references, though. During the Taisho period, 1912 to 1926, Neighboring islands and Japan began traveling and writing about Yonagunijima. One of them is titled An Expedition to the Southern Islands by Sasamori Giske. The following quote was soon confirmed by other writings concerning the island for only women. Quote, women on the island have white skin and are attractive and thoughtful. It takes only a few pennies for someone who enjoys co- accompaniment of beautiful women to have one of them in attendance during his stay, provide drinks, and serve him all night, unquote. Sounds like a fantastic place. I knew I put this at the right spot, too, because this is my next sentence. Before Jay starts buying one-way tickets, not to mention <laughs> a time machine, there's more. <laughs> I- <laughs> I literally wrote, I want to send you the script so you can see that. I wrote it right after that. Oh, my God. You know me too well, my Yeah, friend. clearly, clearly. This is so interesting. This reminds me of the Wonder Woman story. I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah, right? it does, it does. Um, <clears throat> a counterstatement was made by another writer who also described the island to be full of beautiful women as a trap for men. He says that any man embarking upon Yonagunijima or immediately attacked, some taking in, by the women to keep the island pristine. The men they keep serve for reproductive purposes, but coupling with an older belief of a fertility goddess blessing or cursing the island long ago, the men cannot live there for very long after visiting. 
the hidden paradise becoming more and more folklore and satire depending on the time period. A very similar myth is also commonplace in Korea, which makes you wonder how many branches does this island produce within cultures. I believe that all stories are true as they are false, more, more like exaggerated truths. There's something else, though, the reason this entry is so long. Something else entirely that has nothing to do with the women. Okay. Some 2,000 years ago, an earthquake hit Yonagunijima Island. An underwater pyramid and other structures were discovered, presumably part of the island that broke off. Wow. This is the most outright supernatural thing. Marine geologists from the University of Ryukyu's Kimura Masaki visited and studied the pyramid. He first surmised that the monument was over 10,000 years old, what? believing to have come from the mythical lost continent of Mu, a lost continent. In the 2000s, he revised that estimation and concluded that it was, it was, and concluded that it was above water roughly two to three thousand years ago, not ten thousand, mm. based on current water levels. He described the largest structure, this largest structure, to be a monolithic, steeped pyramid, while dissenting opinions believe it's a natural rock formation, a rare formation to be sure, but a natural occurrence nonetheless. That's what they say. Kumira Masaki's controversial opinions on the pyramid has led to the has led the scientific world to call his work a pseudo archaeological claim. Because of this, he hasn't been able to raise money or permits to uncover it. Uh -huh. There's more to it, but I'll leave Yonagunijima there since it'll be a it'll belong to a different triangle episode or something more tonally appropriate. Mm, okay. Wow. A lot to unpack on that one. Yeah, and see the pictures, <laughs> you could see that it maybe was built, maybe not. It looks like it could be built. It's not just like a like a. There's just there's stuff around it. There's like weird things that look like it was. Then at some point, other straight into the pyramid. Are there yeah. straight lines on this pyramid? There's some lines, yeah. I mean, it's very difficult for nature to mm -hmm. create perfect straight lines and angles and things. So, so those exist on this structure. I haven't seen the picture yet. That should signify it's most likely man-made or something made it. It's something strange for sure. Yeah. In the island of the women, God, the, the jokes were coming to my mind, but I'm just. I bet. I bet. I'm going to be an adult, Oscar. I'm going to be an adult. Yeah. What a great. You, usually saying saying it all out it usually works. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, what a great entry. That one. That one was really fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was really fun. Yeah. Right. Um. So this island where the women supposedly lived, it's still there today? They're still uh, fighting over it? No, no, it's done. It's, it belongs to Japan. Japan. Oh, you said that. Japan. My yeah. bad. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, and it's no longer an island of women, if there were, if it ever was. But just most likely, I think what they mistake it for, I think it was just like a whole, nah, I don't want to say that. It's, a, it's an island of, you know, workers. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think they were just uh, ladies of the night who embarked there. I mean, obviously... Not, not there were men there, but I guess it was just known for an island of paradise, like Nevada or Vegas or something for for men. You know what I'm saying? Like I think it was just known for that. People could get there, a lot of, you know, a lot of commercial shipping people on their ships can head there and enjoy a good time. Okay, right. I think that I think that's what they're mistaking it for. No one's saying that, but I'm thinking that's what they're mistaking it for. It makes sense. And yeah. it became legend as something else. Maybe they, maybe a lot of mermaid or siren. Siren legends came from that kind of idea, right? Because it's an island in the middle of, you know. So right. you can see a lot of the origins of a lot of things. And because no one really wrote about it historically for a long time, and no one knows how long it's been there, uh, you can't say for sure. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So it was that your last entry for this episode? No, there's one more. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. No, it's okay. The next one is... Another one from Turkey. It's called Troy. Oh, Troy. Yes, that Troy. This is the final entry for the segment and of the show. Just in case, I'll go over some Trojan legendary highlights. The story of Troy is known on the lips of most people due to a classic work of fiction titled The Iliad by Homer. This and the Odyssey is what kept Greek mythology alive in the world up to today 
and the Trojan War is a significant part. In the book, it tells the story of a greedy King Agamemnon warring and eventually burning Troy to the ground. It tells the story of Helen of Troy, the world's most beautiful woman on earth, right. marrying Paris of Troy, betraying her husband. It tells the story of the mighty Achilles, a nearly unkillable and most skilled fighter that famously died in Troy once his weakness was discovered forever living as a legend. The Achilles heel. Yeah, well, I was about yeah. to say that. The Achilles heel as a medical layman word comes from this legend and the Iliad. So why am I bringing Troy to this episode of quote-unquote real cities, especially considering that other juicy theoretical cities like Atlantis has no spotlight today? It has been proven that the city of Troy was as real as Carthage and Roanoke. I grew up thinking it was fiction, a story and a movie. Did you go through this? You know, how that you mention it, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know. think so. I grew up thinking that, yeah. I didn't know Troy was real either. Admittedly. Right. Before UNESCO added Troy to the World Heritage List in 1998, there were some historians and archaeologists that believed in its existence. As early as the 16th and 17th century, travelers had identified Troy with Alexandria Troas, which was only 12 miles south of the actual site. In 1822, a Scottish journalist became the first to accurately identify Troy's locations excavations, trial errors, forgetfulness, and, re and reinvigorated interest kept professionals to prove this legend. There are many people who helped with the discovery and really a great subject for a standalone episode. Historians taught the thought, sorry, not thought. Historians thought the name Troy came, came from a peninsula in Turkey anciently called Troad, and they were right. Investigations and excavations dating as far back as 1977 bore the proof that eventually a geologist and a classicist needed to present to the world. So in November of 2001, they compared <clears throat> they compared they, yeah, they compared the present geology with the landscapes and coastal features described in the Iliad. Hmm. and other classical resources and concluded that there is a regular consistency between the topography and the novel. They're still working at the site. As of today, it is still unclear whether or not the characters in the Iliad were real people from Achilles to King, Ag King Agamemnon. One thing is for sure, though, I appreciate the godless, magical, less realism version of the film, Troy, a little more. Wow. So, are the, so I'm assuming there's no ruins there? Yes, there's some. There, there are pictures there's some. Mm -hmm. there, okay, so that we have pictures there's of that. Some. Great. Yeah. Um, so what did people think it was before they discovered it was Troy? Oh, I, but they don't know. They probably never discovered it until they found it. Or I don't know what they thought it was. I didn't look that up, actually, if they thought it was something else or if they only found it because they were searching for Troy. Wow. Okay. I did not know that answer. Did not know Troy was real. I had no idea. I thought it was I, fictional. I really thought it was fictional. I really thought so. So I haven't anything here, but uh, it goes along with this. I end with Troy to end the show for a few reasons. Firstly, it's crazy for me to think about something that was based in fiction turning out to be a fucking real place. Secondly, the story of Troy and a few others remind me of an ancient Greek historian named Herodotus. Have you heard of this guy? I have not. Okay. You want to talk about what in my life led me to this topic? Herodotus is a big influence. I first heard about, of him while listening to a history podcast about some war involving ancient Greece. What's special about Herodotus is that he's credited to be the world's, Western civilization anyway, the world's first historian. But his writings are nothing like we're used to with our history books. He wrote real accounts and real names in detail, but as a story. He'd have a narrative and conflict and dramatic flair. His writings read like fiction, but they weren't. It was the style of the time. It took forever for modern historians to realize he was being truthful, more <laughs> or less. Makes me wonder about Homer's The Iliad concerning Troy and other places and events. They weren't the same person, Homer and Herodotus, but you and I can get there, right? Yeah. It's mind boggling to me to think of the possibilities. Like, was Achilles real? You know? 
is Ciudad Perdida the actual lost city of gold that people think is in the Amazon? Or better yet, they found many, many pieces in the Amazon that could be the lost city of Z, but I couldn't include it because there wasn't enough for me to justify it. Is Eliki the lost city of Atlantis and we're just too disappointed to admit it? It all reminds me of magic acts. They're amazing until you know how it's done. Then it feels like a letdown. That's how conspiracies and the supernatural feel like sometimes. Double check those pictures of Troy. They are not marvelous and hard to imagine them so, but they're real. There are subtle hints and messages in these segments and these three segments and locations I talk about today. And it overall connects to part two, of course. Cities lost the time are there to remind you how lots, how lots of today's legends and myths started, how they evolve and how we see them. Don't you think some wide-eyed kid in Sparta looked up the sky and tried to imagine a giant city with amazing structures as Carthage and Babylon? See them. See them as works of fiction and impossibility. Cities once hidden is to remind you the elusive nature of conspiracies. Hey, have you heard of the underground city? It's supposed to be 10 levels and live side by side with moles. Truth with lots of icing. You can see people saying this. Cities of magical realism are varieties of those theories or improbable possibilities made real for good or ill. Did you, like I did, find the cities with some mystery left on the bone to be more interesting than the others? The word count for Yonagunijima is way longer than the other entries because it's the most interesting. We just don't know enough. What's part two about? I'll tease you by saying that part one sets up the events and places of part two very nicely, but not linearly. It'll be more focused and timely. I hope my wide angle lens approach to researching topics like this and like coincidences, for example, is help, uh, helps you to see some forests and less trees. Nice close to see some forests and less trees. That's great. Oscar, what you put together here, my friend, was not an easy uh, task. No, it was not. Wow. Like two weeks. I mean, uh, just on the research alone, bravo. Yet alone, mm -hmm. trying to spin it into a story like you did. Mm -hmm. That's really impressive. Just Thank you. The history, the dates, the names, the events, yeah, and so many. Uh, very good job. Um I've only I only heard of maybe two or three of those places, so uh, that yeah. was great. Hopefully, knew, it's, a, it's yeah. new to our listeners too. Mm -hmm. I know well, yeah, a few more, <clears throat> but but yeah, um, there's a double edged sword though to this episode. Um, the good thing is that it covers a lot of ground, but the bad thing is that it's only it's like uh, that saying a mile wide but an inch deep. I can't. There's not like an insane amount of research into any of these. You know what I'm saying? But just enough to give us a taste of what right. they were. Right. So that's how that's how this episode is. If you want to actually a lot more, none of that is included in these two shows. They're all about a wide thing about it. You know, so it's it's much bigger, but not as deep. No, I think it, I think it's a nice way to tackle it. It allows you to cover more ground and and travel the globe more with this topic. Uh, definitely, definitely. So yeah, great job. Um, listeners, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, how's your voice there, Oscar? It's okay. I was losing it for a minute there. I heard. Your... I heard. My bro. I was going to ask if you wanted to take a break, get a drink. No, no. I knew I was, I was towards the end there. But um, yeah, do you have a favorite? Do you remember them anymore? It's like so many. Oh, man. Well, obviously, it was, it was cool to learn a couple extra things about uh, Pompeii and the... Uh, uh, forgive me the name the the island of women that was a fun story that yeah was a very fun story yeah so i would say those uh tobegli tepi that was cool to hear about yep um i want to say there's there's something with uh an ancient stone statue at tobegli tepi uh um the nerf of alexandria the, no the it's like the nerf man um oh oh i don't know I don't know. I didn't go too in depth. Yeah, I'm gonna stop right there just so I don't trip on my own dick trying to explain Pleasure this. yourself. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But it's supposedly like the 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 positively most oldest statue that was ever created on this world. And uh the the man has six fingers. 
So there's a huge uh, oh really yeah. backstory to this thing, and it's. I wish I got more into it. I would have written it down. Probably. Yeah, I believe that was at Tobegli Tape. But anyway, so it was fun to hear about that. Uh, I can't wait to see where you're going with this. Yeah, yeah, it's also a perfect part. Like it's also a perfect separation because part two is it's 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 the same, but it's very different. Great. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to it, listeners. I hope you are as well. Uh, Oscar, if that's it, what do you say we uh, jet on out of here? Let's do it. Oscar, take us home. Can I start this whole thing by saying something and realizing full well that I may have gone overboard? With what? First of all, do you have a sense of humor? Uh, sometimes, usually. Some, sometimes, usually? Yeah. <laughs> On occasion, when it fits your, new, fits your needs? <laughs> That's right. Let me tell you a story. Yeah. Uh, when did that, um, then that, uh, that, that call came in yesterday, right? Yes. When you sent me? Right. Yes. What was, yeah. what was yesterday? April 1st. Another word for April 1st is what? April Fool's. Did you really? Yes. Are you serious? Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I was so mad last night. <laughs> I know. Like, I dreamt about that bitch. I know, I know. I was gonna do it this worst. So I was gonna wait till we started recording and you played the thing, and I was gonna announce it there. Oh, was, oh, he might be too mad about it. So I'm gonna, <laughs> tell, him. I'm gonna tell him first <laughs> with a question: Does he have a sense of humor? <sighs> it was April Fool's. April, happy no April Fool's. No shit. Yes, happy April Fool's. She was a coworker of mine. We rehearsed it. Oh my God! Well played. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was gonna get you with the phone number. You did. That's right. I did. I've been planning this for two weeks. <laughs> Are you serious? Well, no, not planning it. I, I was going to ask her on right before on the day of. Yeah. I was wondering. I'm like, he didn't write back. He, like, <laughs> why didn't he write back? Oh my yeah. god. I'm sorry. I'm so, so we sorry. didn't get hate mail. No, we didn't. Oh, dude. It's hard to hate us. I thought so. Wait. Actually, my original plan was to tell you like the next year. <laughs> Just let me stew. <laughs> let you stew on, like, have it broadcasted. Let you stew. No, but no. no. Oh, that's awesome. Sorry. That was good, Oscar. April Fool's. Happy. <laughs> April Fool's. Dude, I did, man. I dreamt about her, like, what she would be like. Yeah, I don't think I noticed it. I think I noticed it maybe an hour before I sent it to you. Because, nice. of course, I had to listen to it, like, 30 times just to really <laughs> get it under my skin. <laughs> Perfect. Play that up. Go nuts. Tell me all the details of your stewing. That's what we want to hear. Um, so I figure I give us material for the opening right now. Oh, that is fucking hilarious. Um, now, are we going to play it? Because still, where... Of course. I mean, she's totally meant for it. She's fine. For she's, yeah, she's cool. Oh, man. I added the... Well, no. Did she add? No, she did. She came up with the, with the part at the end. Write better content. <laughs> give better content. I'm like, oh! <laughs> okay just that last shot man put me over the edge waiting for me to do easter eggs now uh to do easter eggs? like painting yeah, and shit color yeah isn't that color. the kids job isn't that why you have kids yeah but you know we we sit around the table and we try not to argue and <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know what's a recipe for argument is <laughs> Being together in a room with them. I mean, exactly. That, I mean, aren't you breaking the first law of this? It always looks so easy on television or in your head, but when yeah. you do it, that's it the thing with work. movies and TV show. They don't show you the scenes before and after that scene that you remember, right? They don't show you how the father just fucking slaps one of them in the mouth like five minutes later after this. Break all the eggs, right? Break now you don't eggs. get an egg. Right. 
handcuffs, the whole thing. Not bad. They they had to take her during the day with police escort to get her clothes and stuff from the house. All the neighbors saw it. Of course. Oh man. So yeah, crazy. I mean, there's some there's some <clears throat> there are some bugs on the windshield of her life. She won't be able to squeegee clean right now anymore. Love the analogy. Yeah, that's quote, a great. Analogy. I am quoting a show. Don't give me credit. I'm quoting oh. a, a direct quote. I just came up with right now in my head and just said it. It's some community, but that's I, I love that line though. I haven't been. I wanted to use it for like a month now. I just got a reason to do it. That is hilarious. Yeah, so she won't be able to live out some of this shit. Honestly, no. Well, I'll text you on the road. Yeah, yeah, text, yeah. Text me on the road if you see something weird or whatever, or if you're about to die. You know. Um, <laughs> yes, you got it. <laughs> So I can stop writing and researching right away. <laughs> well, this is done. <laughs> done. <laughs> Hun, you know how... what's back? <laughs> yeah. uh, do you know I'm so crazy? I've thought about, God, if something happens to me, like, like especially after this, so after my dad died, you know, I, I yeah. went through this phase where I was, I was really paranoid at night. I always thought I wasn't going to wake up, you mm-hmm. know, um, so I would think to myself, like, man, how would we let our listeners know if I die? Oscar doesn't know what I do to upload this stuff. I should tell Oscar in case I die. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. That's another thing that's crossed my mind here and there. Um, more so lately as we get more and more serious. Because um, there's, like, different levels of severity that we have with the show, right? Um, for me, over the over five, four years now? Five years? Whatever. Yeah. Um, but one of them is that, you know, like, I should really fucking know how this fucking business works, or at least have some passwords or something. Not that I'll use it or just but have it somewhere so I can access it if I ever need to. Yeah. Um, or you know, or not, even, not even death. It could just be like, what if you get into an accident? You're in a hospital for like a week or something. And, you, and I have to post it for like, oh, what, are, you know, what if that happens? No, I think it's a great idea. We should, yeah. I, I will make, sure, make it a point to do that at some point soon. Yeah, yeah. Because I know you use... Uh, different things than i have ever used so <laughs> i know i know that much yeah <laughs> so. well one day we could do like a zoom meeting and i could show you everything i do and mm-hmm. we could record it so you if just store it and if anything ever happens you have step by step what to do cool sort of yeah. thing awesome well talia spending the night by severo's house with angie oh yeah so you know i i drove there i drove there today reluctantly and i'm like fine you can stay over and uh cause the kid needs to get out a little bit you know and and They've yeah, been, she'll take anyone. <laughs> right, yeah. They've been very careful and no signs of anything. So I was about to ask that, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, I went there, and I was in a hurry. I wanted to get back home. I didn't want to be in the city long. Every – I must have – dude, yeah. 50 parking spots I found, right? Every yeah. single one of them had dibs. Yeah. And the weirdest shit in those spots, too. Just – Anything oh, yeah. they could pull out of their house. You could tell that, you know, you, you could tell like a little bit about, about our household stuff, right? <laughs> uh, what they choose to either neglect or what they have around that they can throw off there. Um, yeah. I have weird stuff. I must have one of the weirdest things. What do you what do you call dibs with? So I I don't have much. I don't have spare chairs, by the way. I don't I'm not putting a chair, one of my precious chairs out there. So yeah. what I have is I have these two wooden blocks. Not too not very big. Big enough to notice barely. Like that's my worry is that I'm I'm afraid some car is going to not notice it. And actually, it'll fuck up their suspension <laughs> if they do. Um, yeah. These wooden blocks about, I don't know if you can, can even see me that well. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> yay big or so. And uh, like um, like my torso size, roughly a little less. And okay. um, and uh, they're wooden, but uh, on two sides, on both of these blocks, they have uh, this, like, it's embedded with this chalk wall or a piece of chalk meant to, like, you know, draw in it or write whatever. And huh. we use it at Starbucks for like our specials. We, we oh, okay. Each every week, like which coffee is on sale or what's the new drink, and we would draw with this chalk thing. I stole them, so nice. <laughs> They've been that in my trunk. Unique. Yeah, so it's very unique. Um, and uh, my only issue with them, and the reason I, I, I took, I, I didn't steal them by the way. My uh, manager was going to throw them out. They, we don't need them anymore. We have our own different things to do that now so i was like i'll take them home don't throw them out i'll take them home <laughs> um and i did but i haven't used them because they're, they're so embedded with the previous whenever we last wrote on it i can't remove it <laughs> i can't like clean it properly so i kind of put them in my trunk and now i use it for this so the people who see your dibs also see the coffee of the day from years from ago. like four years ago yeah <laughs> that's awesome 
Yeah. So, that is unique. That right? is unique. It is unique. Probably tells a lot about what I do. Um, but usually people use chairs or buckets. It's almost always chairs or buckets. Yeah, I saw tons of chairs, buckets, cardboard boxes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Severo used like a, a, a weird bucket. Sl- I don't even know what the fuck it was. It was the weirdest bucket I've ever seen, but that's what he's using. God, but even his buckets are weird? Even his buckets are weird, yes. It had like some strainer built into the bucket. It was very strange. Hmm. Uh, I was in a hurry. I didn't I didn't ask what that was all about. But it was oh, just, is, I think that's for mops. It, it, it could be. I just never seen it. Right. You know, uh, the, the way this was made. But anyway, just every spot I found, man, for blocks, mm-hmm. everything was dibbed. And I was like, mm-hmm. fuck. So yeah. Talia was asked, she's like, why are you so mad? And then I had to explain the dibs, you yeah. know situation and what she said she couldn't believe well she couldn't believe that people get fucking beat up and shit for taking someone's spot yeah oh yeah because it's not the it's not the fact that you can't park in one of those spots you park, you can you can get a you can move boxes not a big deal sure but the thing is that whenever you come back to your car you have to worry about what's if your car is damaged from the exactly spot you took yep. right did they slash my tires or bust a window? Or... Well, here's the thing, Jay, is that I was thinking the same thing. Like, if someone takes my fucking blocks, I'm going to fucking do something to that car. Yeah, and I would have. I didn't, but no one took it. But, like, I would have. It's a unwritten rule, man. You don't – you just don't do it. Yeah, don't – and I don't know if it's Chicago only, but we we will fuck your car. I mean, we just need an excuse. And, you, and giving us an excuse like that. We is... should – this is – we should talk about this briefly. <laughs> this is – I mean, this is a very unique, I think, like you said, Chicago thing. It might be. I don't know. Do other cities do this? Really? No one else does this? I'm I've, sure they do. I mean, I, we don't have it out here. That's for sure. You know? Right. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, God, no. No. Um, well, you can't park on major streets because uh, if it's over two inches of snow, you get a ticket. Um, right. still, cars still parked there. Some of them, I, there was plenty of spots there. I didn't use them because I don't want a fucking ticket. So uh, that night was it Monday night? The first, right? Our, I think ours was Monday into Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, Monday, right? When it was really going after work, it was just so hard to find the spot. It was so hard, and I had finally decided on one not too far, like a half a block distance away from my house, just like on a different street, and. Um, and I did, dug it out. I didn't get inside till like midnight, after midnight. Oh, I got out at nine thirty. So like, oh my god, this is so horrible. Yeah, because um, I mean, you guys got a, a a real significant amount of snow, didn't you? Like, yeah, we did. I heard oh. eighteen inches. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, like two porn stars worth of dicks on there. Wow, that's a lot of dicks. <laughs> <laughs> at once. Yeah. At once. Yeah, that's, back to that's back. nuts, man. And not like next to each other, like to increase the growth. It's like ne- like this, you know. You have to, <laughs> one on top of the other. They're connected, yeah. Ball to tip. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ball to tip. That's good. That's a good one. Good. Hilt deep. Um, so, yeah, it was just so uh, – and it was like the – they for some, I don't know why they decided to do this, but they the trucks didn't go – the first snowstorm, like whatever, before Monday um, – he, there was right away, you know, trucks everywhere salting and the highway was were frying the whole time. Um, but man, on the way into work, it took me like an extra hour to get to work because they hadn't oh, shit. even started. And I was like, and I heard that it was a decision made to wait a little while till I guess Tuesday to start doing them. No shit. I don't know why though, but they decided to do that. Can't do that, man. <laughs> so. Tuesday and Wednesday, which thankfully they were my two days off. I didn't get out. No, I just sh- stayed home. Wow. I didn't even know what, how bad it got until I Wednesday, <laughs> until I had to go. To damn, work. damn, yeah. damn. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm done, man. I'm so done. I'm sick of seeing white. I need green. You need some green. Need some um, green. Well, I mean, how much are you thanking Lucky Stars that you were working from home, man? Oh, dude, can you imagine if okay. I had to hit the road in that shit? I would be a paranoid wreck. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember going to the Dakotas in like January. Worst Mm. decision I ever made. I didn't think I was going to make it. It got so bad. Yeah. Um, Right. Yeah. And they don't, they don't plow like we do either. You'd think the Dakotas would be ready, ripped to go. They don't. So. Yeah. Well, maybe they do in the inner cities, right? Or downtowns, but that's it. Not what I noticed. Oh, really? Yep. They they maybe yeah. once maybe twice but the majority is left I think up to the cars to just beat down that snow. Yeah, you know I mean it's both surprising and not surprising because of how 
much business and revenue and moving parts are to Chicago versus other cities? It has to be that. It, it could be. be that. Could like be. The reason why we put a sort of a quote unquote a premium into all this stuff. Because I heard, I've heard friends in the past, you know, who like who come from not very snowy areas or where they get like one inch and they it's shut down. The entire town is shut down. Oh yeah. Because they can't do anything. Well, look, like, what, like one inch of nothing. Dude, look what was happening in Texas. Oh my God, that's Texas right. Texas was like a third yeah. world country. Yeah. Uh, was it all? Of the, it was just certain parts or was it no, all? It was it? the whole state of Texas. What, what's the story? I don't know. I know very little. I know that one kid died from hypothermia. I know a couple little things, but not much. I don't know. The whole so I don't, I don't know about deaths, but yeah. I have a number of part, you know, business partners that are in Texas. Well, yeah, it's like the size of a country. It it really is. You can't yeah. drive one end to the other. You have to fly. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I have a number of number of business associates there, and they're like, "We haven't had water in four days. We haven't had electricity in four days. Um, their houses, uh, like my old boss, he's in Louisville, Texas. He uh, mm-hmm. inside his house, inside his house, got to thirty eight degrees. Wow. And no water, no electricity." Uh, rolling blackouts, you know, electricity would come on for maybe 10 minutes and then boom, gone. Mm-hmm. Now they're under a, a water boil. It it's like a, it was like a third world country down there. They didn't know what the fuck to do. Well, no, because all their lives they lived in comfort of the first world. Yeah, exactly. I, I talked to guys in their 60s and yeah. they're like, in 60 years, we've never seen this. Zero yeah. weather. Yeah. And at first I was laughing. I'm like, zero, I'm out in zero. I'm out in uh, shorts and boots shoveling snow, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that was like on Sunday before anyone knew how bad it was going to get. Then I felt really bad making fun of them. 